السلام عليكم وعليكم السلام Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our academic activity for today. So today we'll be having three lectures, inshallah. First, the second lecture will be presented by Abdullah Hadeb about long-term mechanical support followed by cardiac transplant. And the third lecture will be about complications of heart transplant by Dr. Noel Gumi. We are glad to have two distinguished consultants from King Faisal Specialist Hospital, Dr. Firas Khalil, who is a cardiac surgery consultant, and Dr. Musaad Hussain, who is a cardiology consultant. So we'll start in five minutes, inshallah. عبد الله 
Okay. Yes, guys, right. shall I start? Very, very fast. Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum, Shabab. Salam. Welcome, Dr. Faraz and Dr. Msaad. Uh, we're happy to have you here. Um, uh, Dr. Faraz is a consultant cardiac surgeon, heart failure uh, surgeon, and uh, Dr. Msaad is a consultant uh, heart failure cardiologist and transplant. Um, happy to have you here. So I'll start the uh, first talk about the long-term mechanical security support. Uh, please, uh, Dr. Faraz and Dr. Msaad, feel free to... Uh, Stop me at any time to add comments or ask questions uh, and to enrich the discussion. And uh, it's a mainly uh, a educational uh, talk rather than a uh, just a formal uh, monotonous talk. Okay, thank you. So, um, so I'll start with the uh, in general the so the mechanical signal support as an introduction. So heart failure is a leading cause of death and public uh, health concern all over the world. So the lifetime risk of heart failure in population above 40 is actually 20%. And uh, 5 million heart failure patients in the US uh, with, with uh, um, estimated cost of 30 billion uh, on the economic uh, burden. Heart transplantation always been limited uh, therapeutic option uh, for patients with end-stage uh, chronic heart failure because of many reasons, uh, one of the main them is availability of donors. And the increasing number of patients with refractory chronic uh, heart failure uh, with advancements in treatments uh, of uh, cardiac diseases and decreased number of organ donation are result in expanded waiting list and waiting times for heart transplantation. So uh, the options uh, available for heart failure with reduced structural fractions, usually medical therapy, cardiac risk recognition therapy, implantable calibrated defibrillators, heart transplant, and mechanical circuitry support. So uh, in general, the, advanced, the, the uh, principles of advanced heart failure treatment, medical therapy, and the corrective surgical intervention, and then cardiac support or replacements. Um, so the appro appropriate management with antihypertensive, diuretics, phase active drugs, intrapic uh, therapies has been shown to improve symptoms. So the progression of disease, of disease, of disease, disease, and, and in more severe disease, uh, the specific surgical interventions such as uh, cabbage, uh, valve replacements, and uh, ventricular restoration procedures and selected patients with heart failure, uh, the uh, refractory to uh, uh, guideline-directed medical therapy may ultimately be considered candidates for heart transplantation or mechanical security support. So, um, uh, in the HeartMate 2 trial, actually 33 centers uh, uh, participated, and today actually, uh, Nowadays, there's 174 uh, bad centers, if, if, if not more, in the USA and all over the world. Uh, those are just uh, this is table of near classification, uh, uh, we all know. Uh, and uh, this is the uh, Intermax uh, registry for mechanical security support. So the patients with uh, cardiogenic shock, uh, crash and burn would be uh, one. Uh, two, progressive decline in despite anotropic support. Uh, and uh, the device uh, uh, with device ECMO or LVAD. And uh, I, I don't want to go through it uh, all of it. So, uh, also, I included the uh, consensus of uh, European Association of Catholic Surgery on long term mechanical support. And those are the class of recommendations we all know class one, what does it mean? And class three, usually harm. We focus mainly on class one and class three. So uh, class one, it's recommended for reversible causes to be ruled out before uh, going for long-term mechanical security support. And uh, uh, for patients with uh, NEHA class, um, uh, long should be considered in patients with NEHA class 3B and 4 injection fraction less than 25%, at least one of the following criteria, which is iron trouble dependence, uh, end organ dysfunction, uh, temporary mechanical support, 
uh, this recommendation is class 2A. Uh, also, there's a uh, uh, same here, but with a less uh, recommendation with the, with the less requirements in other patients. So patient characteristics associated with high risk for poor uh, outcome post uh, uh, left ventricular acid device, patients with advanced age after careful evaluation of comorbidities and frailty uh, should be considered class 2A. Uh, patients with peripheral vascular disease, uh, uh, well, it's depending on severity. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try not to uh, take more time on the other recommendation, focus on the hormones. Uh, so the patients with active systemic bacteria fungal infection, not recommended class three, patients with untreated aortic regurgitation or mechanical aortic valve is not recommended. Uh, patients with untreated severe mitral stenosis is not recommended. And uh, patients with irreversible liver dysfunction uh, uh, as uh, diagnosed, and they, they might be uh, eligible for uh, uh, combined uh, cardiac and liver transplant, but maybe not, uh, not the uh, candidate for long-term mechanical support. And poor neurological and cognitive function. Uh, as you know, uh, mechanical support requires a lot of attention from the patient uh, himself. And... Um, um, uh, patients who suffer dementia, again, the same problem. Uh, active substance abuse, uh, so the compliance will be low. And patients with malignancies um, may be considered expected survival more than one year, although uh, it might, uh, something should be considered is the, uh, the availability of resources and, and, uh, and the high cost of the uh, device, which will usually be limited to... Uh, uh, more fit patients, uh, and it depends on the centers. So indications, so different types of indications, bridge to transplantation, bridge to recovery, destination uh, therapy, or uh, uh, bridge to candidacy. Um, so bridge to transplantation patients with, uh, uh, um, so uh, heart failure, uh, keeping the patient uh, uh, alive uh, so and for with better quality of life to reach uh, uh, to get a appropriate uh, donor uh, until it becomes available uh, or bridge recovery patients post uh, uh, let's say uh, cardiogenic shock uh, requiring uh, support uh, albad is placed and waiting for the patient to recover and then taken out although this is uh, in, in at least from my um, uh, from my perspective, uh, bridge to recovery, like, I don't know, I've never, I've never seen a patient here. I don't know, Dr. Firas, if you have comment on bridge to recovery indications in general in, act, in yeah, practice. Yeah, um, bridge to recovery, recovery is for elderly patients and uh, uh, basically patients who are not eligible for transplant yet they have... Uh, 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 no uh, obstacles or preventing factor from living beyond one year, like, such as uh, cancerous uh, problems. So uh, usually beyond 65 or 70 uh, years of age, they go to destination and uh, therapy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one thing, uh, maybe Abdullah will add uh, this is about bridge to recovery. Uh, it's usually, uh, it is less than one, it's a rare event that they actually recover and uh, if you uh, usually, most of the time, if you use it as a bridge to recovery, actually you're not gonna, there's a chance you can optimize them with medical therapy. So majority of the patients, we don't do that, uh, as Dr. Firas said. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, and also- just, uh, 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 I'm sorry, just to add one point, uh, we would always push uh, for the bridge to recovery uh, non-durable devices especially that uh, you have to look at the pathology, myocarditis, postpartum, all this, most of the time they recover. So you try to, to bridge them with a short-term uh, support because if you put a long-term support, deconditioning the machine is, is not an easy option and the surgical outcome is, is, uh, is not favorable. Uh, it carries a lot of comorbidities. Mr. Magal, from Saad, it is less than 4%. In the, in the durable devices. Fahadi, Fah, you, you have to really, it depends on the cardiologist and how, how uh, they optimize uh, medical management and uh, with invasive and non-invasive until you reach there. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sam, uh, Dr. Franz. Um, and uh, next will be destination therapy, long-term mechanical success. Well, so alternative to transplantation where, where patients uh, uh, maybe uh, not uh, candidates for transplant or uh, to, due to availability of uh, organs or uh, uh, highly sensitized patients or, uh, or actually some patients they, after, after uh, they get uh, implanted with ALBAD, they uh, elect to uh, just continue with the, with the device without uh, transplant. Um, uh, next is uh, bridge to the decision uh, or bridge to bridge. So use of short-term cancer support and cardiogenic shock and tenem dynamics and organ perfusion are stabilized. Um, uh, uh, and um, it's, it's somehow uh, similar to the bridge to recovery. Uh, but um, in, in such cases, and the bridge to uh, decision is that um, patient in, in acute shock and not has not been uh, clearly investigated to know the underlying uh, diseases and the causes. Uh, bridge to candidacy, um, as we mentioned earlier. So uh, patients with, uh, let's say, uh, pulmonary hypertension due to left-sided failure and you put uh, LVAD, uh, improve their uh, function, and with the uh, pulmonary vasodilators, uh, and then improve their uh, pressures with, and you repeat your the right ca right heart calf, and they become candidates for transplant in Luston. Uh, bridge and transplantation. So patients who have a deteriorating clinical status who are, uh, uh, might need to reach the transplantation. We already mentioned that. Uh, this is shot from the SHLT showing the uh, percentage of patients bridged with mechanical secondary support over the uh, years and with different uh, with different uh, cardiac uh, underlying pathology. Uh, as you can see, the the non ischemic cardiomyopathy uh, is the uh, highest. Uh, here, especially, uh, especially in the latest years. Uh, we already went that. So, uh, just uh, more on the bridge to candidacy. So, it can, can be life saving, uh, reduce. It can, uh, so uh, patients with high pulmonary hypertension, reduce pulmonary hypertension, enable improvements in nutritional status, and, uh, and it, it definitely shows, uh, showed a improved post-transplant uh, survival. Uh, so in patients with uh, destination uh, uh, therapy, it's estimated that uh, actually by, by 2015, nearly 50% of continuous flow device implants were implanted with a strategy of destination uh, therapy. And uh, most uh, common contraindications to transplantation and destination therapy uh, where advanced adrenal dysfunction, uh, high body mass index, pulmonary hypertension. And uh, crossover to transplant group was around 12% uh, uh, to one uh, year. Okay, so let's start with the more fun aspect as the devices uh, themselves. So first generation devices provide, it provide excellent team dynamic support and improved survival, uh, pulsatile in nature. So pulsatile with move, moving uh, uh, um, uh, components in it, uh, flew through a pusher plate uh, and uh, relatively large housing need for extensive surgical dissection to implant and presence of uh, large external lead and precludes implantation in small patients and um, most of the females uh, in that case uh, with body surface, uh, body surface uh, area less than 1.5 kg per meter square. Long-term use is limited by ha high probability of device malfunction and uh, infection by uh, estimation of one year. This is the Thoratec PVAD. Uh, 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 that's how it looks and it's paracorporeal. Um, this is the heart mate, uh, uh, the first one, um, and it's um, usually not. It's, it's so the device is not in the, th in the thoracic cavity. It's in the abdominal cavity, and it's huge as you can see. You can imagine, 
um, and uh, loud and uh, uh, although it, it, it in, the, in the rematch trial, which is the first one that showed the uh, benefit of the um, uh, left ventricular assist device use uh, in terms of survival compared to medical therapy, um, but um, the moving uh, parts here and wear and tear of the device was the main advantage in the loud noise. Uh, this is just a, a different uh, picture where you can, you have the inflow, the outflow, the same concept of uh, the newer devices uh, with the external back and uh, battery. This is the uh, Nova Core uh, device. Um, and this is uh, just a rematch trial eligibility criteria, uh, which uh, the patients were enrolled in uh, um, we're using the HeartMate uh, uh, XVE. So the knee class four symptoms, more than 90 days on ACE inhibitors, the Joxin, diuretics, uh, left ventricle ejection fraction less than 25%, cardiac index less than 2.2 liters per minute, and wedge pressure of more than 18 millimeter mercury, and on IV inotropes and ineligible for, ineligible for cardiac transplantation uh, and deemed uh, for medical uh, therapy. So the results show that the alpha survivor is uh, clear with at one year 50% versus 25% uh, medical therapy group and two years 23% versus 8% uh, in medical therapy group. And uh, of course, the quality of life improved with LVAD, LVAD morbidity. Although LVAD morbidity is considerable, infection uh, mechanical malfunction with that device, as we mentioned. Um, here the um, uh, the the medical therapy so the the LV dysfunction you can see the uh, uh, difference and in the sepsis uh, with the Alvad group of course we have the the drive line out of the uh, uh, the body as a main source of infection and Alvad uh, failure uh, happened in eight uh, in the uh, Alvad uh, group. Uh, pulmonary embolism and thrombosis and uh, were also the, one of the main issues and complications. Um, so the second generation uh, use of continuous uh, uh, flow devices, rot rotator, rotary pump of axial flow design and continuous flow pumps have only one moving part uh, that uh, uh, the rotor and the uh, hands are much more durable rather than many parts, smaller, quieter, and surgical implantation is generally less traumatic, and smaller drive lines, uh, lower rates of drive line uh, infection compared to the first one with improvements in uh, technology. Uh, as you can see, this is the rotor uh, here, this is the heart, uh, uh, this is the heart made tooth or a tech. Um, uh, it's actually in the thoracic cavity. Uh, this is the inflow, the outflow, and you can see this is the uh, lead for the uh, drive line. This is just another picture. This is the Jarvik uh, 2000 uh, unique power delivery system uh, based on continuous flow axial pump, uh, intraventricular position with the whole pump sitting uh, with LV cavity um, and uh, but it not not uh, I think uh, gain popularity in uh, in uh, real uh, practice uh, um, Dr. Firas do you have comment on the Jarvik uh, device? It's an excellent device and uh, two things that did not help the device to gain uh, popularity Number one is uh, the, uh, there was a thrombosis uh, rate uh, in it. Uh, and number two is uh, the owners, uh, Dr. Jarvik or Professor Jarvik, he uh, kept uh, hand on managing the device and not to expanding it uh, or, or uh, to go uh, uh, with a corporate. So uh, it did not have enough training for uh, surgeons. It did not have enough training for funding and grants uh, to run trials on it. So it remained very seldom to catering uh, specific uh, centers. 
uh, that's why it's a good device, but uh, no investment. And you know, uh, implanting a device is not the only thing that you need. You need the uh, support of the company, to the staff and the hospitals. So that's why. Okay, thank you, Dr. Ross. Uh, next is the Berlin Heart, which is a continuous uh, flow axial flow pump marketed in Europe. Uh, and uh, uh, this one is uh, one which is the uh, same concept as uh, uh, the uh, HeartMate um, uh, continuous flow axial uh, pump. Uh, it comes in the intra, uh, like inside the body and outside the body, in core uh, and paracorporeal X core uh, VAD. The impeller operates at speeds between 5,000 and 10,000 rotations per minute. And uh, the X-Core uh, first was the, uh, which is, uh, comes in the next slide. Uh, this one is, uh, is the first pediatric ventricle device uh, to be FDA approved. Uh, so um, as an indication uh, here, uh, it's recommended to have recently obtained uh, uh, documentation cardiac morphological and uh, ventricular physiological data, uh, last surgery, and of course, to evaluate the congenital uh, underlying uh, pathology in the patient. Uh, and the implantation of device with patient uh, device mismatch is uh, not recommended. And in the mid long term, mechanics expose and spit durable, implantable uh, devices. Um, and in patient children would need mechanical support, implantation of intracorporeal continuous flow of ventricles device and subsequent discharge home should be uh, considered class 2A. Okay, uh, here uh, the HeartMate 2 trial. So the primary composite endpoint was achieved in more patients with continuous flow devices than with uh, pulsatile uh, uh, flow devices. Uh, so it was uh, 62 uh, of uh, 134, so, and one two year survival rates were significantly higher, 68 and 58 percent, uh, with uh, HeartMate 2 compared to HeartMate uh, 1 device, uh, 55 and 24 percent. So 68 for the HeartMate 2, 55 and 58 and 24, two, two years. Uh, the durability of HeartMate 2 was significantly greater, significant reductions in the rates of major adverse uh, uh, events. So device rate and infection uh, were uh, uh, less, uh, much less. Um, Non-device related infections, uh, right heart failure, respiratory failure, renal failure, and 38% uh, rate of reduction in the rate of pre-hospitalization. <clears throat> uh, this is also comparing the past time continuous with the same HeartMate 1 and 2. Uh, you can see that the uh, pump replacement uh, significant uh, p-value uh, and the uh, much less in the continuous uh, LVAD related infections, uh, cardiac arrhythmias uh, 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 were actually higher uh, in, in terms of percentage, uh, less, uh, less in the continuous, higher in the pulsatile and uh, rehospitalization uh, was uh, more in the pulsatile. Third generation, which is the, the most currently used generations, most advanced, is actually centrifugal pumps, uh, long durability anticipated uh, to be five to 10 years, compact in size, minimize the risk of thrombus formation and uh, hemolysis. So uh, the, uh, uh, let's say revolutionary HeartMate 3, uh, which probably uh, considered one of the best in the, uh, in the, in the market and uh, probably gonna stay for some time uh, leading the uh, devices implanted. Uh, so it's fully levitated centrifugal flow device commercially available in Europe and the United States. Rotor spins at rates of 3,000, 9,000 uh, revolution per minute and generates up to 10 liter uh, per minute of blood flow. It operates uh, rapid changes in rotor speed to create intrinsic artificial pump pulse so it has some kind of mechanism that it, it has an artificial uh, pulse that will uh, uh, allow to uh, uh, flush whatever uh, blood that is uh, 
is not moving any deck in, in that uh, with that uh, technology it reduces uh, the uh, pump thrombosis uh, drastically and of course w one main advantage is the uh, uh, there's no uh, tear and uh, tear and wear on a device uh, this is the housemate uh, 3 as you can see is much uh, smaller uh, here uh, with the inflow directly and then outflow to the uh, aorta uh, so the momentum 3 results uh, which uh, compare the LVAD to uh, HeartMate 2, uh, patient advanced heart failure, fully magnetically levitated centrifugal flow pump was superior to mechanical bearing axial flow pump with regard to survival, uh, free of disabling stroke or reoperation to replace, or remove, or functional device. Uh, and then uh, we'll talk uh, later on about uh, the HeartMate 3 implantation. Uh, just here a few slides on hardware. So it's a continuous low centrifugal third generation pump commercially available in Europe and the United States, approved the bridge to transplantation in November, and destination therapy uh, in September. It's much smaller than earlier devices and easy to surgically implant. Uh, the impeller spins rates between uh, 1,800 to 4,000 revolution per minute, generates up to 10 liter blood flow. Uh, with its uh, smaller devices, it uh, was proposed as a better option for pediatric population. However, this, uh, this uh, device has been facing a lot of uh, issues with the uh, thrombosis and uh, very recent, uh, less than a month, uh, FDA warning and uh, from Medtronic itself uh, issued a letter advising uh, physicians uh, to stop implants of the system. Uh, so FDA said that there have been more than 100 complaints involving the delay of failure uh, to start uh, the uh, heart, sorry, to start the uh, hardware internal pumps, which led to uh, 14 deaths and 13 pump uh, removals. For the new uh, uh, new leverage device implants, uh, such uh, it's recommended about HeartMate 3 LPAD instead of the Medtronic EdgePad uh, system. That they add that, however, the patients who had the the uh, hardware already and its function, it's not recommended to remove it. Um, uh, and the, that the risk uh, uh, of uh, expanding it does not outweigh the benefits of putting another device. Uh, so uh, this is just a, I'll skip that uh, study of the hardware. This is the MVAD, which is, um, Apparently, did not actually had even more issues with thrombosis. It's uh, let's say a miniature uh, of, of uh, device of the hardware, which even smaller than the hardware. As you can see, look how small it is. And uh, but uh, it again had uh, many issues with uh, uh, thrombosis, and uh, did not reach uh, practice and approval until now. So if I so, may, uh, to and <clears throat> just to add uh, that uh, the more they minimize the devices, the more uh, the complication. And uh, this also, <clears throat> they did not learn from the Circulite. Circulite was another uh, device uh, that was running, uh, but with uh, partial support up to 2.5 liter, and it was implanted auxiliary. And uh, it had a lot of thrombosis, so Medtronic bought it and killed it. Uh, and uh, that's where the challenges uh, that uh, we all are facing. Uh, we need fully implantable device. We need smaller devices. And yet uh, thrombosis uh, has not been uh, uh, overcome. The, so that's where um, HeartMate 3 with a bigger device, but safer approach. And that's uh, and the reason for pulling out uh, HVAD hardware is due to a device malfunction mainly more than the thrombosis. A lot of devices failed uh, to restart after stopping. This is just mm -hmm. my comment. Thank you, Dr. Pras. Um, uh, Dr. Ramsa, do you have any uh, comments uh, to hear or uh, additions? Uh, not not really, uh, but. Uh, 
one thing is uh, like uh, as Dr. Carr said is uh, uh, one thing about the HPAD is uh, uh, yeah. people are stopping implanting like it's pulled out of the market as you, as you said. So uh, I know some hospitals they have them, so we have to be careful about that. But uh, otherwise, uh, nothing I can add for that for that matter. Thank you. Um, so. Uh... So uh, it'll be start talking about biventricular support uh, candidates. So severe biventricular failure, predominant right ventricular failure, with significant left ventricular uh, disease, complex congenital heart diseases, and patients who require long-term biventricular support are probably considered for biventricular uh, devices. So uh, is. Um, so devices available for biventricular support, uh, thoracic uh, PVAD uh, intermediate durability only, and uh, total artificial uh, hearts will, will come across an investigation, compassionate use of hardware as biventricular support. And uh, with some uh, uh, centers uh, uh, in Europe, and here it's been done uh, multiple patients in King Faisal, biventricular support with the uh, HeartMate uh, 3. This is the uh, first uh, uh, total artificial heart to be implanted in human, the Leota, a total artificial heart. It was uh, Texas Heart Institute. Um, the the uh, famous uh, total artificial heart in the market is the Syncardia, so uh, contact surfaces are made of polyurethane, uh, consists of two artificial ventricles, pneumatic positile, metronic valves, uh, is uh, 70 uh, ml stroke volume, and I believe it comes in a, a smaller uh, 50 uh, ml stroke volume. Uh, major drawbacks are the complexity of implant procedure and its size, and requires a body safe surface area of more than 1.7 meters square. Uh, the uh, this is a uh, picture showing the implantation so ventriculectomy uh, removal removal of the valves this is how uh, it is before implantation and that's uh, that's how it is after implantation this is a device uh, here case done by Dr. Faraz uh, of the Sincari Total Artificial Heart uh, however this device although it's uh, it's cool and uh, and uh, approved. Uh, has a lot of uh, uh, issues and complications with renal dysfunction and also with hemolysis. Uh, and it's thought that the uh, renal dysfunction is due to uh, uh, loss of natriuretic peptide release due to the uh, uh, ventriculectomy. And uh, hemolysis is with the um, device malfunction, uh, sorry, device uh, function, uh, the way it functions and the hemolysis it happens, it occurs. Uh, this is the uh, BioCore uh, total artificial heart, employs a single moving part, a centrally magnetically rotated rotor, provides co complete cardiopulmonary support and uh, still investigational. Uh, the uh, new promising uh, total artificial heart uh, is the Carmat. Uh, it's uh, built by Carmat company. Uh, I believe in incorporating the uh, uh, Dr. Carpentier uh, uh, experience, uh, the center over there, and uh, uh, the company Airbus Technology. Uh, and building this uh, uh, total artificial heart. So uh, it's actually uh, not small. Uh, the uh, the new thing in it it's um, it it adapts to the um, to the physiological needs of the patients. Uh, so the uh, so there are sensors in the uh, in the device itself, so it can change the the rate uh, and the I believe the force, if I'm not mistaken, uh, of the uh, pumping. Uh, the uh, inner surface is. Um, it's all biological uh, uh, pericardial uh, bovine uh, valves. Um, and uh, so it ha it's much less thrombogenic, uh, postulated. And uh, 
So composed of implantable bioprosthesis, a sportable external power supply system to which is continuously connected. The device uses highly biocompatible materials, offers unique self-regulation system, and its pulsatile nature are expected to reduce or eliminate risk of uh, rejection by patients' uh, bodies. Of course, this is the what the company says. Approved in Europe for uh, bridge to transplant uh, recently, and uh, ongoing early feasibility study, approved feasibility study uh, by FDA in the US. And I believe they recruited 10 patients. Uh, that's what I read in, 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 in three different centers, one of them uh, Baylor, uh, and they're starting. Uh, uh, although I've read like the first four patients implanted, one of them, ha one or two had um, device issues, but the uh, longest uh, like survival was 540 days. So it is uh, promising. Um, uh, again, this is a different picture of the device with the uh, four uh, valves. Um, one more thing to add, there is a, a, a fluid, so it's hydraulic uh, system. So there's a fluid here, uh, which used to pump the blood, and of course with the um, surface of uh, bovine pericardia. If I may uh, interrupt, uh, Abdullah. Yes, sure. sure so uh, so in, when it comes to total fissure sure heart, whether syncardia or CARMAT, it is, uh, as you mentioned, extremely uh, difficult to to uh, not only implant. Implants could be easier than explanting. And uh, we had three patients uh, experience with them, and uh, we have transplanted uh, one and or two. Um, so uh, the uh, the device to explant it, it's. Uh, it's probably the toughest uh, surgical procedure. The, uh, in regards of implanting it in low uh, body surface area, it has been done in 1.3 and 1.5 because you always remember that uh, the, the, the majority of uh, pathology is dilated cardiomyopathy. The uh, second thing in regards of the valves, mechanical valves were safer because it's used to uh, have the valves from ATS, which lasted uh, over 20 years of experience to utilizing this valve. The uh, uh, 50 ml can go down with the lower even body surface area, but everything is uh, uh, measured uh, for both CARMAT and Syncardia. You have to measure the sternum to the T12, T10, sorry, and it has to be uh, above 10 centimeter. And of course, uh, the width as well with the pericardium, which is uh, usually above 18 centimeter due to uh, dilated cardiomyopathy. Now, in, in regards of the CARMAT, yes, it has biological valves and it's promising, but uh, <clears throat> two things uh, did not uh, uh, increase popularity for this device and slow down the uh, company. They've been working on it for over 10 years. They've been in, uh, in, in trials for over six years and uh, they, uh, they haven't invested enough. Uh, lack of support from the government to them. Um, they have moved into other company, uh, other countries because France did not uh, support. Uh, and they have implanted in, uh, in patients. I am aware of 13 trials, uh, 13 patients, because they asked, they requested us uh, to join their trials and start uh, at King Faisal. We have refused because uh, uh, it happened. Uh, two patients had uh, short circuit and uh, died sudden death uh, due to the malfunction and it was not uh, fully investigated uh, with uh, repeating the trial after repairing uh, whatever happens so uh, it, it it was um, it was carried away with a cowboy uh, sort of uh, attitude by the french and uh, that's why they're failing to expand uh, the trial and expand uh, acceptance for this device the other thing, it's bigger than uh, Syncardia. It's much, much bigger than Syncardia. I've seen it being implanted. I've seen post-implantation uh, and on patients. It has uh, many devices attached to the patient from the outside. Uh, the drive lines is much bigger than the Syncardia and the SSI, surgical site infections, is, is much higher. So uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm pessimist when it comes to this device. I'm really hoping that this take over. It has a lot of uh, physiological uh, the action, uh, which is really good um, when the patient is asleep, when the patient is uh, playing gym, uh, gymnasium, 
Uh, so that's something positive. However, as an idea, it's perfect. As a device per se, I think they really need to uh, invent something smaller and uh, and uh, less uh, comorbid. That's when it comes to the car mat. And that's what pushed us to go for HeartMate 6 or, or uh, buy Vinscara Durable Support. Remember, these patients... Uh, are uh, terminal and uh, you try your best to optimize them but uh, sometimes you need to stop and think and uh, say this patient is not going to be uh, bridged this whether it goes to a transplant or palliative therapy and that's what i want to add in here regardless of all the support we have we need to sit back think of the uh, patient of the resources of the agony uh, on both sides and the outcome and decide whether this patient should go for direct transplant or palliative therapy plus medical management. Thank you, Dr. Faraz. Uh, definitely uh, the uh, practice is, uh, is much more difficult and application is, uh, is uh, uh, different than the, uh, the way we look at it at, as a different, uh, as like, uh, yeah, and as a technology or as a machine, like a human, but these react uh, differently to such uh, devices. Um, okay, this table is a uh, just a summary. Uh, I believe I might be nearly uh, time for this uh, lecture. So it summarize the uh, different uh, trials uh, of the devices been. So we have here the rematch trial, which investigated the heart, uh, heart made press one against medical therapy, uh, Intrepid, uh, investigated no, uh, Novacor, uh, and you can see here the number of patients uh, involved. Uh, and uh, as you can see that um, uh, the heart uh, patients, you can see are even the recruitment of patients uh, in the trials uh, were uh, excellent. Um, uh, okay, this is a good uh, table to look at later on, if you like. Um, this is the uh, different types of devices and the way it, flow, uh, the way it works, the continuous uh, or uh, pulsatile, uh, and the design of the devices, the uh, FDA approval. Um, so in terms of preoperative evaluation uh, for those patients, renal function, liver function, uh, of course, upper function. And in terms of coagulation, uh, withdrawal of uh, dual antiplatelet preop uh, and or, or vitamin K antagonist, uh, use of short acting intravenous anticoagulation, um, uh, administration of procoagulants shortly before implantation, uh, and uh, optimization of coagulation for uh, surgery and nutritional uh, optimization. Uh, so problems with the, with the uh, mechanical support and general complications, cardiovascular, uh, so failure of the unsupported ventricle, so a, um, a supporting the left ventricle might uh, uh, unleash or uh, or, or open the eyes to, for, for a, a very weak right ventricle, uh, arrhythmia, uh, cyanosis, shunting, PF, uh, in terms of uh, PFO will be devastating, ischemia, angina, um, uh, systemic uh, bleeding, end organ failure, infection, uh, immune sensitization uh, with uh, ALVA, uh, with mechanical support in, term, uh, in case the patient will be transplanted at a later stage. And it might cause in some patients, uh, of course, uh, decreased quality of life compared to normal, normal uh, patients. GI complications, with, which, which can be devastating with the anticoagulation uh, and device-related uh, thromboembolic obstruction uh, co compression of the device, uh, improper orientation, device infection, device failure, air embolism, and hemolysis. Um, regarding aortic valve and root disease, so uh, closure of the aortic valve, uh, more than mild uh, aortic insufficiency is not recommended. Uh, and the closure of mechanical valves is not recommended. And uh, even with anticoagulation, thrombosis might uh, uh, 
curve with mitral valve disease ex exchange of functional mitral mechanical or biological prosthesis is uh, not recommended uh, although uh, i believe um uh, uh, don't know if you have comments on, on on patients who who can let's say candidate for uh, elvad and uh, have an existing uh, uh, prosthetic valve whether it's, it's mechanical or uh, or uh, biological and uh, or patients uh, requiring other than repair uh, and like prosthetic valves like are they usually candidates and the complication yeah so uh, when it comes to the mitre when it comes to let me talk to the aortic when it comes to the aortic it has to be competent you cannot have aortic regurgitation because you're going to have inner vicious circle with the pumping and uh, and the leaking. Um, so biological valve has to be implanted or repair. There was something called Soon Stitch, it's double O-N, it's uh, Dr. Soon from Mayo Clinic um, who invented that and then it was a failure. Uh, uh, so you need to repair or uh, you need to replace the biological valve with a biological valve for the aortic position. In mitral, it's a different story. If there is, <clears throat> Uh, significant MR, you can still, some uh, literature say you repair it and then it, you implant the VAD. Majority says uh, just implant the valve, uh, the VAD, because uh, the, the power of the suction events coming from the left ventricle and left atrium would overcome the regurgitation volume. And that has been proven uh, even with our center. It, when there is mitral stenosis it is a must if it is significant above two out of four it's a must to to replace it with bioprosthesis if there is an existent mechanical mitral valve you either decline for vad if if uh, if there is comorbidity such as cross clamp and the rb function or you can remove it and implant bioprosthesis in presence of mechanical aortic valve uh, uh, you should remove it and put bioprosthesis, and that's the guidelines. However, in some centers, uh, uh, they increase the uh, anticoagulation, the INR goes beyond two and a half, and uh, with antiplatelet therapy, and you try to make the heart eject by lowering the RPMs, encouraging. Now, in bad hearts, that doesn't uh, reject, then you're in trouble, and you might not uh, consider the patient for that. Is it clear? Very clear, very clear. Thank you, Dr. Vance. Um, okay, uh, right heart problems with the uh, like uh, left ventricle support. So it's a major problem actually uh, with, with implanting LVAD and it's uh, always a, a worrisome issue uh, with the uh, the RV dysfunction incidence of 30%, so 10, 20% of patients with LVAD require RVAD, suggested by rising CVP and uh, falling VAD uh, flows. Right ventricular EDP equal to uh, CVP, and uh, medical management would be avoiding volume overload, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, inhaled nitric oxide or prostaglandins, anotrope to increase RV contractility, and reduce afterload uh, through lowering uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. RVAD is required in fractic cases with uh, with uh, uh, low right ventricular stroke wall index uh, and uh, RV stroke work index and with higher CVP and lower uh, PA pressures. And uh, while I know that implanting it in, in, in a durable RVAD after an LVAD uh, uh, usually have a uh, uh, let's say uh, much uh, worse uh, outcomes or less favorable outcomes. Um, I don't know, Doctor uh, Saad, do you have comments on uh, um, evaluating the patients uh, pre um, pre LVAD and uh, in case of uh, um, how to uh, expect uh, that the right ventricle would tolerate or would not tolerate? Uh, yeah. or would need only short-term uh, uh, support? Yeah, so uh, this, is, yeah, this is actually a very critical uh, point because the problem with uh, RV dysfunction is twofold. First is it can occur early after 
uh, LVAD implantation. And the second one, it can occur late. So don't think about it. Even sometimes when patients are, you put an LVAD in and they do well initially, the uh, uh, RV might fail later. And we have some patients who do that. So it's very critical that you actually be sure you first, you have to know or predict whether the patient would have RV dysfunction. Second thing, you have to optimize the patient before you take them for LVAD implantation. And then you have to be aggressive post-operatively or post-LVAD implantation that they, go, they don't go in LVAD uh, RV dysfunction and they require mechanical support. Because the problem, the moment you put an RVAD in the patient who has an LVAD, their mortality ex, uh, increases substantially. So what we usually do uh, before we implant LVAD, and this is where the surgeons and the cardiologists work together, and uh, I do it with Dr. Firas all the time, is first we optimize the patient uh, medically. So you have to be sure that they are actually uh, uh, dry from a volume perspective. You put them on inotropes, put them on metronone, diuresin aggressively. And then before you decide on implantation, you have to assess the RV function. So what we do, we assess it by a number of things. First clinically, then by echocardiogram, and then by uh, right heart cath, and we look at certain uh, number uh, numbers. Uh, also, there are some scores that have been developed and there are some risk factor calculators that you can plug in the numbers and then uh, see what is the risk of RV dysfunction. So this is very, very, very critical uh, point. And this is what does uh, distinguish a, a good program from a, a, an okay program is where you when you take the patient in, you, you know what the risk of developing RV dysfunction is. And what we usually do, as I said, is optimize them first, then do echo, look at the RV function, look at the TR. The more TR you have, the uh, more risk they're gonna have. And then do right heart cath and assess their hemodynamics, pulmonary pressures, multiple scores such as the PAPI. And then uh, you make a decision with the surgeon about uh, implanting the device. Afterward, you have to be sure that, that you don't, because when you have an LVAD, it's gonna flood the right side with a fluid. So you have to be sure that you're optimizing the RV function with nitric oxide, with inotropes and aggressive diuresis. And we see it all the time, not all the time, uh, ho hopefully, but we see sometimes some cases where they go in the ICU, then they get a lot of fluid and then the RV balloons and then they run into problems. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Saad. What do you think also about um, uh, what I've uh, I brought somewhere that uh, using uh, temporary uh, mechanical support, uh, such as Impella, uh, on the LVAD and uh, to see how the RVAD do and if it, if it um, like um, do well, and then the durable LVAD would be uh, not uh... I'm not like uh, I've heard of this. I, I don't know if it's actually it's been validated because the problem LVAD and impellas are different things. And impella, you can use it for a few days to uh, support a, a, a left ventricle. The RV impella is not uh, like it's not a good device, honestly. And some people I know some people talk about it, but uh, my experience, at least when, when we did it back there, it was not great. So uh, if you are not sure that the patient will fly without an LVAD, don't do it, without, without RV support. Think ahead, either you implant a percutaneous RVAD like what Firas used to do, or what you to do, or implant durable LVAD on the right side. But don't, don't try and like uh, do some unvalidated uh, methods. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Firas, do you have uh, um, comments on the, uh, the uh, right ventricular dysfunction post LVAD and the I think Dr. Msaad covered it all. It's exactly uh, what should be done and what we practice here. Nothing to add. Yeah. Okay. And in case of patients with tricuspid insufficiency, uh, uh, so patients with mechanical support wanted uh, to develop uh, TR because of dilatation of tricuspid annulus, nerve dysfunction, and uh, uh, associated with more length of stay and inotropic uh, support. And uh, so correction of severe tricuspid stenosis at the time, long-term mechanical support implantation is recommended. Class one, re-evaluation of patient moderate to severe tricuspid regurgitation. 
that's it. And of course, uh, before uh, uh, pre-implantation and uh, repairing the valve at the time of uh, surgery, uh, highly advised. Um, PFO, in terms of, in case the patient has a, a, an exaggerated right to left uh, shunting through the PFO, so imagine there is a, a sucking device in the left ventricle and there is a, a, a resulting in profound uh, desaturation and uh, any PFO uh, is closed uh, with uh, bike cable cannulation. Uh, those guidelines just stress on the previous point of closing uh, the PFOs. And uh, bleeding is the most common complication after mechanical skill support. So 20% uh, and up to 50% of mechanically, mechanical skill support uh, device uh, recipients. Uh, so late bleeding most commonly manifests as gastrointestinal nasal. So due to angiodysplasia formation uh, and impaired platelet segregation due to acquired one uh, von Willebrand uh, uh, reduced or absent uh, von Willebrand factor levels are more common with uh, more common with continuous flow devices, and it's thought uh, maybe due to the um, non-pulsatile nature of the, the those devices, uh, non-physiological. Uh, yeah, I'll just skip uh, because we are running out of time. Uh, anticoagulation management for uh, bad patients. Uh, usually, not quite is given for the first 24 36 hours, post -op immediate postoperatively. Aspirin morphine started uh, after that, with no excessive bleeding, and with a target INR of 2 to 3. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so in, in case patients who are unable, uh, unable to achieve adequate uh, flows, hypovolemic kinking of inflow or outflow uh, lines, failure of unassisted ventricle, ventricular arrhythmias, thrombosis of the device. Uh, so uh, infection is a major uh, uh, adverse events of uh, device uh, issues and it has been ongoing uh, issue uh, with the devices, even with the newer devices. Um, however, with the newer devices, much much rate, much less rate of uh, infection. Thromboembolism incidence is about five to fifteen percent higher in the set of clinically uh, important infection, and diagnosed with uh, head CT. Uh, surgical technique is uh, median sternotomy, aortic cannulation, venous cannulation can be done by insertion of two-stage cannula or separate IVC and SVC cannula, uh, so that uh, ASD or PFO closure has to be performed, uh, reconstruction of the tricuspid valve, RV dysfunction uh, in case of severely impaired, and RVAD, uh, temporary RVAD support, and my mitral valve reconstruction is necessary, uh, if indicated. I'll just uh, show the uh, short video of the uh, RVAD implantation. Meanwhile, uh, I want to mention about the anticoagulation. Uh, there is Magentum trial and Magentum trial one, which uh, has proven that with HeartMate 3, we can uh, drop down the INR into uh, 1.5 to 1.9 in the presence of aspirin. And this is uh, uh, CE marked and, uh, and uh, proven in, uh, in the two trials. Now there is an ongoing trial with uh, low INR 1.5 to 1.9 and HeartMate 3 without aspirin. It's uh, called ARIES trial and should be published next year, the first uh, uh, short-term outcome. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, just a regular medium sternotomy if it's not minimal invasive approach and then uh, sternotomy Uh, 
opportunity. You should have showed uh, one of our videos where Faisal Fellata and, uh, or Faisal Shamdin been implanting Elvadia. <laughs> well, I wish I, I, I don't have that video. Uh, inshallah, next time I, I will. Sure. sure. Is it on YouTube? No, sadly, uh, we did not publish it on YouTube, but we have it. Okay, the surgeon is locating the uh, site of the uh, uh, inflow uh, and surgery at the apex. And um, uh, usually it's uh, directed at the, at the uh, mitral uh, um, and uh, it's away from the septum, so it does not uh, uh, cause septal deviation and also impairment of the uh, right ventricle and uh, suction uh, uh, issues. Uh, so it's usually with the echo, uh, the point uh, of the inflow cannula is located away from the uh, coronaries. He's here marking the, uh, the site. This is uh, just a screw uh, punch device. So the coring device goes uh, right lateral to the uh, LED and uh, at the apex side, uh, you have to always identify that uh, with a TE while you're after your sternotomy as well to make sure that the, uh, where you're going to core is going to face the mitral, uh, the mitral valve instead of facing the uh, lateral wall all or the septum, interventricular septum. So this is a very, very crucial point that uh, need to be uh, <clears throat> taken care of. Thank you. As a, as a cardiologist, I agree because uh, I've seen some less experienced surgeons do disasters with uh, this point. <laughs> exactly. And the other point is the perfusion. So the ventricle has to be completely emptied and uh, no ejection. Otherwise, you're going to have a ball of air going to the brain when you core the valve. on Because this is happening on beating heart, uh, no cross clamp and uh, open uh, air circuit if you load the ventricle and make the aortic valve eject. So this is quite crucial to make sure that uh, uh, this point is covered properly. And you run the graft on the la lateral side of uh, the right atrium. So when you reopen again the sternum, you don't go into the graft. And you put it at, implant it at the greater curvature of the aorta so it will uh, follow the physiological flow from the aorta to the, uh, to the rest of the body. And then there is also the implantation. It's not 90 degrees. It's 45 uh, to 60 degrees on a landing zone uh, in order to have less turbulence for the ascending aorta. Hence, no uh, uh, stagnation of, uh, of blood into the aortic root causing thrombus. Thank you, Dr. Um, we'll not uh, we'll not go into surgical technique, but you saw the video. Um, uh, this is the drive line uh, tunneling uh, uh, and the different ways of tunnel, tunneling it try to uh, maximize the track of the drive line to decrease the uh, risk of uh, uh, drive line infection reaching, reaching to the uh, device and to the mediastinum uh, and to, even if it happened it will uh, be local uh, infection and uh, Uh, so what is the future direction? Advances in technology have led to creation of more durable devices, improved clinical outcomes for mechanical secular support recipients, uh, minimally invasive approaches, and such will be de developed. And it's already uh, done uh, regularly, let's say regularly in specific patients with heart metry, and may be used as across a wider spectrum of patients and purposes. And patients with less advanced heart failure may receive partial 
executive support to improve quality of life, and the accumulation of clinic experience will allow consensus guidelines to be developed. And uh, uh, there are uh, many publications on this, as Dr. Prasa say, less, uh, less anticoagulation, uh, more advanced devices, uh, uh, choosing the patients better, and uh, for better survival and outcome. Uh, thank you, everyone. I hope I, uh, the lecture was informative and uh, was not uh, boring. Um, I believe I'll uh, have the transplant uh, lecture after that. Uh, I, I don't know if anyone have any questions uh, for me or for Dr. Firas and Dr. Saad. Please. Uh, Questions? Thank you, Abdullah. Thank you for your great effort. Thank you, Ayat. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, Louis, I don't know, uh, the mic yours. So we can have a break for until. 2.20 and then we'll come back. Okay.
عبد الله Uh, hello everyone, welcome back for the quick break. Uh, so we'll start with the heart transplant uh, topic. Um, okay. So we'll talk about uh, preoperative management, operative, uh, uh, operative techniques and uh, results. So uh, some bit of a uh, history. So the innovative French surgeon Alexis Carrel performed the first heterotopic uh, canine uh, uh, heart transplant with uh, Charles uh, Guthrie in 1905. So um, uh, uh, the uh, let's say uh, heterotopic is a, a transplant not in the same uh, Orthotopic is a transplant in the same position of the heart, uh, uh, original heart. Heterotopic is uh, uh, connected to a vascular to the vascular system, but not in the same position. Um, in 1946, Vladimir uh, Dimikov uh, of Soviet Union experimented the first intrathoracic heterotopic heart uh, allograft. And uh, the uh, Shumway, Norman Shumway uh, group performed the uh, 1950 autotopic heart transplantation in dogs with cardiac pulmonary bypass, preservation of the donor heart by immersion for five minutes in, uh, uh, in a four degree saline. They standardized surgical technique in 1960, reporting that five of eight animals survived for. Uh, is uh, uh, six to 21 days without uh, immunosuppression. And uh, so, it, so it, it was a hard and glorious journey. So the first uh, human cardiac transplant was a chimpanzee xenograft, University of Mississippi by James Hardy in 1964. So a uh, primate heart uh, was uh, unable to maintain the recipient circulatory load and the patient uh, uh, scummed several hours post-operatively, uh, basically uh, died, but it was um, a very uh, brave, uh, let's say, step. And then uh, Christian Bernard, uh, Bernard surprised the world when he performed the first human-to-human -human heart transplant on 1967. And uh, this is the diseased heart was removed from the first heart transplant uh, received. Um, so the endomyocardial biopsy was first, uh, let's say, in Thimetan developed in, uh, by Philip Cavus in 1973, provided uh, a reliable means for monitoring allograft rejection. And the uh, advent of a cyclosporin dramatically increased the patient's survival and marked uh, the beginning of modern era of successful cardiac transplantation in 1981 and drastically improved the survival. Adults, so you can see over the years, the uh, numbers of uh, transplants. Uh, this is from the SHLT. Uh, 
uh, over the years and how it's uh, increasing uh, uh, all over the years, especially in the most recent years. Estimated that on maybe probably 3,000 uh, uh, transplants uh, uh, are being done in the United States. So in terms of uh, the, um, let's say, most important step, uh, recipient uh, selection, um, and uh, the said you can um, interrupt me any, at any time to add or comment or correct. Um, so the basic objective is to identify a relatively healthy patients with end-stage cardiac disease, refractory to other medical and surgical therapies who have the potential to resume a normal active life and maintain compliance with medical, medical regimen after cardiac transplantation, uh, a multidisciplinary team. So indications, uh, this is from Lawrence, systolic heart failure as defined by ejection fraction less than 35%, except etiology, ischemic idiopathic, valvular, hypertensive, or others, um, intractable uh, angina, uh, intractable arrhythmia, uh, and uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, congenital heart disease, in which severe fixed pulmonary hypertension is not a complication, uh, cardiac tumor, confined to the myocardium, but there's no evidence of disease uh, or extensive metastatic wall, uh, workup. Uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy. <clears throat> so uh, in terms of uh, uh, primary pathology of the uh, cardiac disease, uh, this chart by chart showing the uh, pathologies in the patient uh, what can you see in the non-ischemic uh, cardiomyopathy uh, even increasing in proportion uh, over the years uh, and um, um, with the ischemic cardiomyopathy uh, making a, uh, the next uh, bigger portion and other pathologies come. Uh, congenital heart disease is still uh, somehow uh, lying back with many patients uh, of small sizes and uh, lack of uh, donors and maybe not uh, um, fit for transplant. Absolute contraindications would be age more than 65, 75 years, may, be, it may vary with the centers, uh, fixed pulmonary hypertension, unresponsive to pharmacologic intervention, systemic illness with limited survival despite transplant, uh, uh, such as patient with uh, new plasm uh, other than skin with less than two to five years as uh, pre-survival and uh, uh, other diseases mentioned. Age, so age is uh, actually controversial, physiologic rather than chronologic age. And uh, so a few rejection episodes in uh, in, 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 the, uh, in elder ages than younger ages. And uh, studies show, some studies shows older patients have lower risk of rejection, but uh, increased risk of uh, development of non-post-transplant uh, lymphoproliferative proliferative disorder cancer. Uh, with the, also cancer is a growing issue uh, with the long-term survival of uh, transplant. This, uh, uh, chart uh, showing the ages of transplant uh, recipients uh, over the years, which you can see that the age group and the purple of age 60 to 67, even in the age uh, 70 is increasing over the year. It was not nearly non-existent before that. So a fixed pulmonary vascular resistance of more, of more than six foot unit and transpulmonary gradient more than 15 millimeter mercury are acceptable as uh, absolute contraindication. Uh, so uh, in case, uh, so the patient usually assessed for reversibility with sodium nitroproside, adenosine, prostaglandin, melanone, or inhaled nitric oxide, acceptable uh, decline in pulmonary vascular resistance, ideally, 2.5 wood units, or at least by 50%, with maintenance of adequate systemic uh, systolic uh, uh, blood uh, pressure. Uh, uh, and one thing, uh, Abdullah, but one thing uh, important for the surgeons is uh, for this pulmonary hypertension is uh, you don't do these numbers and the right heart study 
uh, initially when you see the patient. So you have, because sometimes when we see the patient and we do these numbers and it's gonna become an absolute contraindication. So you have to optimize the patient and then see what the numbers you get afterward. So usually you have to diarrhease them, keep them on, and then after you do that, you get these numbers. And if they're still showing the same thing, then yeah, it's a contraindication. For how long, Dr. Msaad? For how long what? How to you will optimize wait. Yeah. Yeah, until you, see, you feel that actually you reach their, like the target, for example, you assess them clinically, you see their uh, volume status, their JVP, you assess the response, urine output, creatinine. If you feel like you're not going to reach any further steps or you're not going to achieve any more uh, optimization, then it's time to do the, uh, the right heart cast study. But there's no point, and it doesn't make any sense if you do the right heart study when you are actually, the patient is volume overloaded and you haven't diarrhea them because you're going to get wrong numbers. You're gonna get pulmonary hypertension, and then when you uh, and then when you this uh, uh, repeat it after a few days, it's gonna show normal numbers. So it's the uh, you don't the amount of time is just depends on the patient's status and how they are responding to therapy. Okay. Uh, so uh, patients with left ventricular device and uh, pulmonary hypertension group uh, two, was secretly, we, I believe we uh, touched upon this um, aspect in the previous uh, uh, talk uh, with uh, patients with, with pulmonary hypertension uh, be, uh, like uh, not being candidate for transplant and then become candidate uh, for transplant. I don't know, Dr. Msaad, um, um, do you see... Uh, um, uh, like s such patients uh, group, uh, uh, do we put such patients here on, on, on LVAD and uh, um, how frequently we see such patients and how much improvements uh, in such specific uh, pulmonary hypertension patients uh, 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 you see in your practice or, yeah. So it's very common. So the problem, like if you think about it from a pathophysiology point of view, why do patients with left heart failure develop pulmonary hypertension? It's usually secondary to uh, long-standing venous congestion. So unfortunately, mm -hmm. the majority of the patients we get referred, they come to us very late, meaning is they have been overloaded for many years or many months. They, they are not on optimal medical therapy. So it's a very common problem because with, with, with time, uh, patients end up developing uh, pulmonary hypertension. And these patients are probably like when you and when you see them and you try and optimize them and they don't respond, and then you do a right heart cath and you see pulmonary hypertension, which is not reversible. The only option they have actually is, and you, you have two options. The first option is not realistic all the time, which is heart lung transplant. The second option, which is uh, the best thing, is you do a, a LVAD as a bridge to candidacy, like you talked about the first talk as a bridge to candidacy. And this is the most common reason for bridge to candidacy for LVADs. And after that, usually within actually, they say three months, most of the patients will recover. My experience and majority of patients within a week or two, their pulmonary hypertension will be fixed with uh, LVADs. So this is, it's a very, very common scenario. And if you look at the bridge to candidacy LVADs, the majority of the patients, why they got implanted was because of pulmonary hypertension. Oh, amazing. Thank you, Dr. Uh, so active infection was a, a sound reason to delay transplantation and up to uh, 48 uh, patients with implanted LVADs reportedly have evidence of uh, infection and uh, treatment for LVAD infection in these patients to proceed with urgent transplantation. So rigorous uh, post-operative regimen of multi-drug therapy, frequent uh, clinic visits, and routine endomyocardial biopsies demand uh, commitment. Uh, history of psychiatric illness, substance abuse, or previous current compliance may be sufficient to cause to reject candidacy of patients and lack of a supportive social system is an additional relative contraindication. So uh, in terms of evaluation of potential recipients, uh, it's a team approach. Um, so involves a comprehensive history and physical examination, labs and imaging studies, uh, multiple 
labels, uh, assessment, uh, laboratory. Uh, so uh, it's extensive uh, in terms of uh, general lab work, uh, workup and uh, blood typing, uh, IgG and IgM antibodies and uh, um, tuberculin skin test. Uh, looking for any malignancies, uh, PS, uh, PSA uh, antigen, mammogram and pap smear, screening against a panel of donor antigens, uh, um, and uh, uh, assessing the renal function. In terms of cardiac, uh, echocardiogram, uh, and uh, uh, assessing the cardiac function, uh, assessing the underlying uh, uh, pathology and right and left heart catheterization, which is uh, important, and after optimization. Um, and in such patients, biopsy even for, uh, earlier to, de to determine the pathology and to determine if the patient is, uh, um, has an irreversible pathology that cannot be treated. Vascular, uh, proof of vascular studies, uh, renal, ultrasound, uh, pulmonary chest X-ray and pulmonary function, function test, and uh, CT chest, uh, uh, gastrointestinal, uh, uh, upper uh, chronoscopy if indicated, and uh, um, metabolic uh, bone decimetry, and uh, neurology screening evaluation, psychiatric, dental, social work, and transplant. Uh, co coordinator uh, educating the patient uh, to what the patient should expect after transplant. This might seem uh, extensive, however, uh, like investing time, effort, and uh, resources in patients should be justified uh, and uh, uh, such as a very scarce resource of uh, hearts available should be uh, directed to uh, the best recipients. Um, and Abdullah, one thing is, uh, uh, this is very, very, very important. And as uh, surgeons, maybe you guys are, uh, uh, you do, the, this is our job. And because we, in Saudi Arabia, we only have, for example, uh, at most 20 to 30 hearts per year. And the patients who need it are maybe at least 200. There are obvious, there are many patients who are, in need of transplant that nobody refers them. So this is a very critical step. And when, whenever you see a patient with end stage, stage heart failure, as a surgeon, you're like the last gatekeeper. I know, I know you guys want to operate and do transplants, but you have to be sure there is nothing that's a contraindication, or maybe sometimes actually the most important when you, when you talk about the indication is maybe the patient was not optimized. I see a lot of referrals for transplant and when I see them, I put them on medication. Most of them, they actually improve and they don't need a transplant. So we need to save the organ for the people who actually need them. So this is very critical. Thank you, Dr. Um, so, uh, so like evaluation objectives, the prediction of the patient's survival for transplant and uh, looking for any uh, core, uh, contraindications. Uh, pharmacologic uh, bridge to transplantation, uh, particularly compromised patients require admission uh, uh, to ICU. So patients, anthropic uh, therapy, rhythm management, fluid overload, management, optimized organ perfusion, and nutrition support. <clears throat> so uh, um, uh, some patients might require temporary support uh, of intraaortic bone pump. And we already discussed the rematch trial. Uh, uh, patients bridged with mechanical support to transplant uh, by ear and device uh, uh, type. Um, you can see that most patients uh, bridged with LVAD. Uh, this is from the ISHLT. Uh, the green represent uh, the LVAD and the uh, BIVAD represent uh, the yellow. Actually, um, it went uh, lower and lower. Uh, with better medical therapy supporting the right side and choosing the patient's uh, in a better way. Um, um, yeah. Um, as you can see that the patients with ARVAD nearly recently non-existent. Recipient uh, uh, prioritization. Uh, yeah. By the way, Dr. Uh, uh, 
I'm sad. Sorry to ask you any question. Um, when was the last time, like, um, have you came across uh, patients uh, supported with um, ARVAD being transplanted, only ARVAD? Uh, uh, durable ARVAD or uh, temporary ARVAD? Uh, actually, durable, but what about serious? Yeah. Okay, so uh, uh, we, uh, Centromag ARVAD, we, uh, we transplanted a few patients on Centromag ARVAD who had primary RV pathology and they, uh, uh, they needed, so we put them on Centromag ARVAD and then we transplanted them. Uh, for pure ARVAD uh, uh, placement, uh, uh, we, like in here in King Faisal, I don't think we did, uh, we did BIVAD uh, heart mate threes. But uh, for pure ARVAD, uh, we, 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 I did not see any case here, but uh, back uh, in Toronto where I was trained, uh, we used to implant, uh, implant uh, ARVAD in a congenital patients. So they, so they have uh, uh, ARVADs and we transplanted some of them successfully. So it's doable. Uh, and I, I don't see it any different from transplanting somebody with uh, an LVAD. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Um, so, uh, pr prioritization, the recipients for transplant transplantation based on survival quality of life expected uh, to be gained comparison with maximum medical and surgical alternatives. Uh, so patients considered for transplantation should be examined at least every three months for evaluation of recipient status. Um, yearly right side uh, heart uh, catheterization is indicated for all candidates on the waiting list and in selected cases for patients rejected because of uh, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, this is the uh, status criteria, uh, the uh, most recent one, the use. Uh, so patients with the ECMO, uh, 14 days, non-dischargeable, surgically implanted uh, VAD, uh, mechanical security support uh, mm -hmm. with life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias, uh, uh, entry aortic balloon pump, um, uh, that would be a status one. Uh, status would be entry aortic balloon pump, and just uh, including uh, ventricular tachycardia fibrillation, uh, mm -hmm. mechanical support that that not uh, not manageable by uh, lesion, and total artificial heart dischargeable by VAD, RVAD, uh, percutaneous endovascular mechanical security devices. Uh, and uh, mechanical security support with device malfunction and mechanical failure. Uh, uh, three would be dischargeable LVAD up to 30 uh, days and uh, um, or mechanical security support with uh, related complications such as infection. Four would be stable LVAD uh, or patients with inotropic without hemodynamic, uh, inotropic without uh, monitoring and uh, patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, restricted cardiomyopathy, or patients for retransplant. Uh, five will be combined organ transplants, and six uh, are remaining active candidates. Uh, this is just a, just a table showing the stats, uh, which was uh, from 2006, one A, one B, and, uh, and two, and this is the current uh, one. Uh, Donor selection, the let's say uh, uh, the second most important step, uh, which is once the brain dead, the individual has been identified as a potential cardiac donor. The patient undergoes a three-phase screening regimen. The primary screening is undertaken by organ procure procurement agency, which is uh, here locally is uh, 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 Scott, uh, the Saudi organ procurement uh, uh, organization. Um, so the age, height, and weight, gender, ABO, uh, blood type, hospital course, cause of death, routine laboratory data, including uh, CMV, HIV, uh, Hep B, uh, Hepatitis C, uh, and uh, serologies are collected. Uh, so both cardiac surgeons and cardiologists perform the secondary screening, which is uh, look for potential contraindications to take that or to, to uh, deny this uh, offer of uh, donor heart, uh, a search for potential, uh, so uh, assess the hemodynamics necessary, review the ECG, chest x-ray, ABG, and echo, 
coronary angiography uh, for male donors uh, more than 45 years of age and female donors more than 50 years of age. History of cocaine uh, use, if, if, if available, the angio. Uh, history of cocaine use uh, or the donor has three risk factors for coronary disease such as hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, or family history of premature uh, coronary artery disease. So the uh, general uh, criteria for uh, uh, donors, uh, suitable donors, age uh, less than 50 to 60, absence of the following, absence of prolonged cardiac arrest, prolonged severe hypot uh, hypotension, pre-existent cardiac disease, intracardiac drug injection, uh, severe chest trauma, evidence of cardiac injury, like let's say sternal trauma or such, uh, septicemia, ex um, ex extracerebral malignancy uh, and glioblastoma, uh, positive serologies for human immunodeficiency uh, virus, uh, hemodynamic stability without high dose iontropic support, uh, and uh, uh, and uh, also uh, past medical history and physical examination would be very helpful. ECG, chest. Uh, uh, echo uh, and arterial blood gas uh, laboratory test, uh, epicardiogram, uh, pulmonary artery catheter evaluation, and selected patients if that uh, available. And um, uh, the final screening of the donors occurs intraoperatively by the cardiac surgical team. Uh, we'll talk about that more uh, further on in the talk. So direct, uh, it will be like opening the heart, or it will be like the final call, whether the heart is good. So whether the team go there, uh, do the echo, and the echo is fine, acceptable by the um, um, uh, imaging cardiologist. Um, uh, then the patient will be opened, uh, and the heart will be assessed. So with direct visualization of, of evidence, uh, so to see the contractility of the uh, ventricle to assess, of course, the, what you can see initially is the right ventricle in front of you. The left ventricle will be uh, uh, assessing, uh, uh, feeling, uh, feeling the coronaries for any atheromas or, or diseases that have been missed by coronary angiography uh, for any signs of uh, trauma on the myocardium um, and uh, um, uh, gently lifting the heart and uh, that would give you an idea of if the, if the heart maintains hemodynamics, uh, uh, that give you, uh, an, 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 uh, let's say, a sign of a good uh, contractility heart. Uh, okay, so uh, this is the crystal. One thing is, one thing is, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not a surgeon, but uh, this method of uh, coronary assessment uh, during uh, uh, before procurement, although it's better than nothing, uh, it still has its flaws. Honestly, like uh, I've seen a few times where uh, the patient had coronary disease and it was felt there is nothing. So we have to we have to keep this in mind. Like it's not uh, like if the patient has high risk of uh, coronary disease, uh, the donor, I mean, and you feel like. Uh, and you feel uh, that the coronary looks normal uh, as a surgeon, like always insist on an angiogram before because angiogram is the gold, gold diagnostic test in, in that matter. So although we trust our surgeon stuff, but sometimes you miss some lesions uh, when you do the palpation uh, and people who procure might uh, tell us more in that matter. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, Victor. Uh, term side, uh, it's not the ideal, yeah. And um, it might just, um, um, I think maybe it's, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a better way uh, if the angio is, is, is good, and but uh, surgically you feel atheromas uh, and you can see, uh, um, I don't know, like if the other way around, uh, happens I'm, i don't know i've never seen it i went uh, harvesting many times but um you're absolutely right no uh, what, I, what i mean uh, what i mean abdullah no yani uh, don't yani uh, we uh, we rely uh, yani we depend on you guys when you go and take the heart but uh we should not make this our only like if you can get an angiogram get it before the 
harvesting. This is what I mean. يعني, uh, although يعني, you guys, guys always go and look, take a look uh, after يعني, before you take the hearts, but always insist if you can't do an angiogram, do it. Sometimes we can't because the donors in a hospital, they don't have angiography or anything like that. So we cannot do it. But if there is a chance you can get an angiogram, especially for donors who are older than 40, have cardiac risk factors, get the angiogram. This is the message I'm trying to get. And actually, just to add to this point, um, I was uh, previously looking at the uh, some literature on marginal donors, and some studies involved patients who, who uh, a coronary angiography was not done uh, or was not be able to done as to consider them as uh, uh, marginal uh, donors uh, until like proven otherwise that the coronaries are normal. Um, this is the Crystal City guidelines for uh, for management of potential heart donors. So the conventional management is adjust volume status of the patient, of course, donor management, which is a very important and critical uh, point. And um, uh, I can like remember myself. I uh, one time went at a, for, uh, with the team in the, for a, for a heart, and the patient was the blood pressure was. Um, very high 170 uh, uh, for, a, for a few uh, days and the patient had no uh, risk factors whatever and actually an echo the uh, the ejection fraction was actually uh, I believe it was 40 if I'm not mistaken uh, and so the, the poor management of donors and after uh, management and after transplantation and the patient this heart was taken and after management, the, the ejection fraction improved uh, dramatically. Of course, the element of brain death is uh, uh, important, and we'll go over it, and it affects on the heart uh, in that aspect. So uh, conventional management adjusts the volume status. So if you have CVP monitoring, 6 to 10, correct acidosis with a normal pH, correct anemia, uh, with transfusion. Of course, this is not easy. Many uh, centers. Uh, will will not give blood to uh, what they think as a uh, sorry dead patient or deceased patient. Uh, let's say this is a waste of uh, resources. Uh, and so I just anatropes to try to keep map more than uh, uh, sixty uh, and uh, uh, so and then obtain a, an echocardiogram after optimization. So if you don't find a rule out any structural uh, structural abnormalities. So if the left uh, ventricular ejection fraction more than 50, 45%, okay, then proceed uh, with the recovery for transplantation. Uh, uh, um, uh, that, that does that not, uh, that not uh, this is just spe specifically about assessing the patient, the assessing the donor. When you go to the uh, donor side, uh, even though that the uh, previous investigation labs that we mentioned earlier, including coronary angiogram, was done. In case if you find the left ventricular ejection fraction less than 45%, uh, so hormonal restation with uh, um, a uh, T3, uh, which is the um, uh, thyroxine, um, as you know that the, with the brain dead patient, they might have less uh, hormone production uh, vasopressin uh, and uh, methylprednisolone and uh, insulin uh, titrate to, to control blood sugar. Uh, sorry. Uh, hemodynamic management uh, with better uh, hemodynamic support, as we said earlier. And then you reassess the patient after those. Uh, if the criteria is met, you proceed with the recovery and transplantation. If criteria is not met, uh, do not recover the pressure and transplantation. Of course, this is not always easy. A lot of uh, the recipient uh, family refuse to wait for, or, or that uh, other organs, uh, uh, other organs for other patients and surgeons, they refuse because of the uh, uh, emergent uh, situation of their patients. Um, expanded donor criteria and alternate listing. So. Uh, so we were talking about uh, ideal patients. So here the the major donors. Uh, so an alternate list is used some centers to match certain recipients who might be excluded from the standard list. So we're saying here that, that some patients are not uh, really uh, 
best candidate for uh, transplant and not considered a, let's say, uh, very good recipient or, or ideal recipient. Uh, and you can say you, you might have also non-ideal uh, donors or marginal donors. You can match those and those with, uh, with such patients. And um, also, uh, use of donors smaller than the recipient donors uh, with coronary artery disease that might require cabbage, uh, left ventricular dysfunction, or donors from older groups. Um, yeah, the, uh, again, on the point of that, uh, what uh, the donors we're getting is a brain dead donors because we're getting the heart, uh, unless it's a DCT donor. So, uh, the uh, Brain death donors, it's having some kind of uh, autonomic and cytokine storm. So there's a lot of release of norepinephrine, uh, so hypertension, as you said, the mentioned the example I mentioned, subendogardial ischemia, myocardial depression, uh, cytokines. Uh, pro, uh, so pro, it will have pronounced vasodilation and loss of temperature control. Intense autonomic activity followed by loss of sympathetic tone. Fluid overload should be avoided to prevent post op graft dysfunction caused by uh, chamber distension, myocardiodemia, so MAP of 60 or more in the presence CVP six to, uh, uh, of 6 to 10, normal temperature, electrolyte levels, acid-base balance and oxygenation, blood glucose uh, at a uh, controlled uh, level. Additional of hormone recitation, as we mentioned, prednisone uh, and uh, uh, thyroxine and uh, vasopressin, broad spectrum antibiotic is initiated. Uh, different centers have their different protocols, uh, and plant culture is usually uh, sent. Um, and then the donor recipient matching so, ABA blood group compatibility, anti HLA antibodies cross match, patient size, donor weight should be within 30% of recipient weight. In case of elevated pulmonary vascular resistance, a larger uh, donor uh, is uh, preferred. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, the important uh, step is the cross matching. Uh, so, anti HLA antibodies, elevated levels of uh, preformed reactive antibodies uh, to HLA have higher rates of organ rejection and uh, decreased survival. And uh, before proceeding with transplantation, uh, uh, actual, actual cross matching to determine whether a donor specific antibodies that threaten the allografts are present. And uh, performing actual cross uh, match can be time consuming and often it's impossible because of the unstable condition of the organ donor or travel logistics and ischemic time, leading to increased cost in transplantation and longer waiting times. So recently that, so the virtual cross matching uh, has been done, which has been done here in the center. Um, uh, Dr. Saad, do you have a comment on the uh, virtual cross match and the uh, how uh, let's say uh, accurate it, ref uh, it reflects on the uh, uh, sorry on the actual cross match. Yeah, so uh, so doing a virtual cross match like now if the donor if we have the donor in our hospital or nearby we sometimes get blood sample and then uh, when we get the blood sample we can do an actual cross match before the transplant which is. Uh, rarely done, Saraha. Uh, the virtual cross match is pretty good, especially if you have a, a, a recent sample. So what does this mean? If you have from the donor, uh, like the donor have a recent sample because we don't take samples from them until they're uh, brain dead, but the recipients, uh, they have, if we have a recent sample, it's usually pre pretty good. Yeah, I, mean, I would say 95% if the virtual cross match is negative, uh, the actual cross match will be uh, uh, negative also. We sometimes have uh, and what happened in a virtual cross match is positive, but the actual cross match is is negative. Uh, so in heart, we don't do actual. Most of the time we do uh, virtual because of organ uh, location and uh, donor location. But uh, just go with virtual and depending on the results, if it's negative, uh, proceed. If it's positive, you have to talk with the cardiologist and the immunologist because sometimes we can do a transplant with positive cross match. If the if the donor is high risk, I mean, like if the recipient is high risk and they're very sick, and you have to go ahead. So it's a very complicated matter. But uh, the bottom line is, if the cross match is positive, uh, even before you transplant, think talk with the cardiologist, assess your patient. Are they very ill? Are they an ECMO? Is this the only heart you can get for them? 
If that's the case, just go ahead and use uh, in, uh, intensive immune suppression. Okay, Dr. Saad, can you, if you don't mind, elaborate more on virtual cross match and how any uh, you have a, a so so is it a, like a database or or or, uh, or expected? Uh, yeah. Okay, so I'll tell you what uh, the, the cross match is. So what's cross match is. So basically we all have HLA antibodies, all of us have. So for example, to simplify, I think, for example, I have, uh, for example, we have patient named Muhammad and uh, he's the donor, okay, uh, a recipient. He has, because he was exposed to multiple events or whatever during his life, he has a lot of HLA antibodies, okay, which could be, uh, let's say they have names, DR, DQ, uh, P, uh, A, and A7, DR56, uh, DR7, D so it's a lot, hundreds of them, okay? And so when I, when we send our lab, uh, blood to the, uh, the recipient blood to the SAM, uh, to the uh, blood bank and the uh, immunology lab, what they do, they study the blood and they, in the, in the program they have, they get, tell us, okay, uh, this donor has DQ7, and the amount of it we call what MFI or how bad, yani how much he has is 6,000. And this uh, DP3 is 5,000. Kida, kida. Right. So this is the recipient. And then uh, you get the donor blood, okay, and you run it in the immunology lab, and it tells you the same thing uh, DQ5, DQ7, DQ, whatever, and how much there is. If when you do a virtual cross match, let's say the heart is in, for example, Al Kuwait or the Emirates, they run the sample there, and we run our sample, uh, a recipient of King Faisal, for example, we run the sample also in King Faisal. They send us the results of the cross match. We tell us, you go on the Mariyad and the DQ7, DQ Madrash, and there is a program, you just plug the numbers, and it tells you if there is a mismatch. You go to the Mariyad and the donor and the DQ7, DQ7, it's the same HLA antigen. There is positive cross match. And it tells you. Oh, I see. I see. Very uh, clear. We, review, yes. uh, we do review the results and then decide whether we proceed or stop. Okay. And then when you get the sample, when the, when the, when the team is back, the actual cross match is done, which is usually soon after exactly. arrival, right? Exactly. If you, within a few hours, they actually put the samples on top of each other, yeah, they mix them. We should find, is there uh, B cells or T cells? Uh, yani, is there reaction between the two samples? Okay. Thank you very much, Doctor. Um, very clear. Uh, so, uh, um, donor heart procurement. Um, uh, so, uh, and this is when like the heart is okay, everything is fine. Uh, so, so after assessment, the team went there. They did an echo, and the heart is okay. Um, um, uh, open this chest and the team is happy uh, and uh, okay was given to the recipient team to uh, to uh, call the recipient to the OR and then uh, uh, harvesting is being done uh, which is the same thing as procurement uh, so media uh, the surgery, uh, so uh, media stenotic precarium is inside heart inspected palpated for evidence of cardiac injury and then communicate the transplant team, SBC and IVC, Zika Spain are uh, mobilized. So this is the heart while uh, when, when you open, as you all know. And then uh, you start with, um, of course, after stenotomy, mo uh, mobilization, uh, PA, especially if the lung team is uh, with you. Um, uh, and then uh, you, you, you go around, you uh, dissect around the SVC. Um, it's different, but the, the way it's done uh, with us here, it's uh, let's say at the level of the right pulmonary uh, artery, uh, you go around uh, and it's uh, it's uh, uh, you go around the SVC uh, and then at the IVC uh, you go. Um, uh, sorry. Okay, and the IVC try to dissect as much length of the IVC as you can. Uh, around the pericardium, uh, of course, uh, uh, it's a critical uh, length where, where the liver team usually will try to get as much IVC as they can, so that they that they can use it for their recipient. And the same thing with the with the with the uh, uh, with the cardiac team. 
um, uh, and uh, so uh, initially is the cardioplegia was uh, for the uh, cannula is placed in the aorta and uh, the plegia for the um, for the uh, for the lung is put in the, in the pulmonary artery um, it, so, Uh, I don't know, Dr. Firas, uh, I don't know if he rejoined. Uh, can't see him here. Okay, maybe he's uh, busy. Okay, and then um, and when everybody is ready, uh, so the cross clamp, so we have a, a, a cannula in the aorta, we have a cannula in the pulmonary uh, artery, and we already went around the SVC. So just before clamping, we snap down on the uh, SVC, so less blood is coming to the heart so, uh, with uh, distension. So, uh, and then, uh, uh, and then you put uh, the uh, cross clamp, uh, start uh, the cardioplegia, and uh, I don't know if we have. I have a uh, okay, and you start the uh, uh, plegia, and then, uh, and then you uh, incise the IVC to drain the to drain the uh, liver. Uh, because they, are, they, they, they also put their, uh, their solution uh, for the preservation of the uh, liver, um, the IVC, uh, sorry, in the, uh, for, for the liver. Uh, so you, uh, the IVC is opened, so you can take as much maximum as you can, as usually just uh, uh, one or one and a half centimeter. Uh, and uh, directly after that, you, in case if the lung team is, uh, uh, is uh, taking the lung, you will uh, drain the heart using the uh, left atrial appendage, making a taking a small chunk or opening of the left atrial appendage, making sure the left ventricle is uh, drained. In case of the um, lung team is not involved, a, an opening, uh, of course, of the pulmonary veins at the back is is uh, is uh, done uh, to drain the the heart. And then a slush of ice is put on the myocardium to use also the cooling uh, aspect of preserving the myocardium. And then you wait until the uh, full uh, solution uh, for both uh, for the heart is done. Uh, when uh, after if it's after it's done, you start uh, harvesting the heart. You uh, you go uh, all the way through the. Um, uh, you go all the way through the uh, 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 IVC and then the pulmonary veins. Of course, if, if the lung again is there, uh, harvesting the lung, you will not be cutting the pulmonary veins. They will literally kill you. Uh, so uh, they, you, actually it will be damage, it's damaging the much smaller length for the lung. So you will need actually the full length up to the left atrium. So the left atrium, so the heart will be pulled um, this is a better picture. Uh, so let's see. Uh, so it's it will be um, uh, not really this way um, because the pulmonary veins is with the heart. Actually, the pulmonary veins should be with the uh, with the. Uh, it's not uh, the picture is not showing it right. So you just open the left atrium in the middle uh, between the valve and the uh, pulmonary veins. Uh, so that we have uh, uh, enough length of cuff of the left atrium to to sew it on the recipient left atrium, and then in the uh, pulmonary artery uh, transect uh, up to the end of the just before the bifurcation. Uh, so the uh, lung team will need the full length of the right and left, and you will need just the full length of pulmonary. And of, of course, you have the recipient. Pulmonary, the aorta, you take as much as you can. Sometimes you need to reconstruct the uh, aorta uh, for any uh, disease. Um, and the SVC, uh, uh, you take uh, usually as much as you can, usually at the level of the uh, right pulmonary artery or zygus. zygus. Um, yeah, and uh, that's it uh, basically. And then you remove uh, the uh, heart, and that's uh, the picture showing the uh, harvested uh, heart uh, with a uh, in the uh, eyes. And then um, this is the explanted uh, heart with an uh, LVAD. Of course, this is heart made too. Uh, 
and this is the normal uh, donor heart. So once uh, uh, this is just the, uh, the steps we've mentioned. So I'll just by time, uh, uh, I'll just go. Uh, we went over it. So allograft is carefully placed and taken place in a basin of cold uh, saline inspection. So uh, inspection is done for final preparation. Uh, you check the heart. Uh, sometimes you do it in the site of uh, procurement. Sometimes when you go back to uh, the recipient OR. So PFO uh, for any PFO or vascular injury or inadequate length uh, should be disclosed to the implanting surgeon so that adequate um, um, uh, let's say decision or call should be made or uh, in case of reconstruction uh, should be done. Donor heart is then placed in two sterile uh, bowel bags and each filled with cold saline and sterile saline filled with airtight container. Finally, a standard cooler ice uh, for transport. Uh, so, uh, of course, there's, a, there's an organ preservation uh, new machines, which is uh, current clinical graph preservation techniques generally permits safe ischemic period, uh, the safe ischemic period is four to six, like uh, usually preferably less than uh, four hours. And uh, uh, the uh, this uh, machine would allow uh, uh, ideally um, longer uh, uh, preservation of the uh, heart. Uh, But in case if the organ is, if this transmedic system is not used, the flushing with uh, the regular cardioplegia would allow for uh, four, uh, four hours, uh, let's say four to six hours safe uh, preservation of the myocardium. Um, if, I, if you may allow me to, to interfere here. Uh, okay. Yes, this uh, OCS system uh, does uh, extend the four hours ischemic time to 14 hours. And uh, of course, it has parameters where we have to follow and see the lactate level, uh, if it's going up or down, that uh, reflects the perfusion for the heart and the function for the heart and the perfusion of the coronaries itself in this machine. Since the, <clears throat> the heart gets cross-clamped uh, for... For, uh, 15 20 minutes and implanted in this machine starts again uh, then it lasts for a duration of uh, four hours to 14 hours bring it back cross clamp again and then put it in the uh, recipient heart in uh, in uh, normally for uh, normal preservation without this machine is we try to be less than four hours uh, to have a, a cold ischemic time so there are two ischemic times a cold and warm the cold is reflecting when the heart is inside the ice bag. It hasn't. It should not be in in the ice. It should be preserved in uh, cardioplegia saline in in a bag, and then the bag is surrounded by ice because you don't want to freeze the heart. And that is should be less than four hours, and that's the ischemic time and uh, cold ischemic time. The warm one is when you explant the heart to put it into the bag, and then. Uh, remove it from the bag and transplant the heart, which is usually should be less than an hour. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Faraz, um, uh, for that. And of course, uh, the, the uh, Kinkas had the experience with this uh, device uh, for long trips and uh, showed uh, uh, great results. Um, however, this uh, uh, organ care system is uh, co uh, costly for single use. It's, um, the set is about uh, 30,000 uh, uh, euros and the approximate cost of reusable organ care system uh, console uh, is 180,000 euros versus like 110 uh, euros for the regular care system, for the regular uh, preservation. Um, uh, this is just a um, case report uh, of same using out of body time more than 10 hours and transplanting it with uh, successfully. Uh, operative population of the recipient, so median sternotomy, vertical uh, pericardiotomy, and heparinized and prepared for cardiopulmonary bypass, 
uh, aortic cannula is inserted just proximal, just proximal to the origin of the innominate artery. Uh, by cable cannulation, umbilical tape snares uh, are passed around the SVC and IVC. Uh, proximal aorta and pulmonary artery are separated from one another with electrocautery. And after the donor heart has arrived, bypass is uh, initiated and cable snares are tightened. Um, the ascending aorta is cross clamped and the cardio cardiectomy is uh, performed usually when the heart, uh, donor heart, enters the room just to make sure um, in case of uh, things uh, like unexpected uh, events happened uh, with the delay of the heart. Um, and the aorta and the main PA transected above the semilunar valves. Um, SVC and IVC are transected at the cable atrial junction. The left atrium is entered anterior to the right pulmonary veins and then incised along the atrioventricular groove to leave an adequate cuff for eye graft implantation. And care should be taken to avoid injury to the left superior pulmonary vein uh, when excising the left atrial appendage. Uh, a sucker placed in the left atrial uh, remnant will keep the field free from of blood and uh, uh, to flood the operative field with CO2 uh, to avoid air embolism. Timing of the uh, donor and recipient cardiectomies is very critical and usually uh, done ideally with, uh, uh, as we said, when uh, the heart donor heart is arrived. Uh, uh, some centers have a protocol that mandates five telephone calls. First, when the team arrives at the harvest size and assess the donor. Next, after visualization of the organ, the operating room, then before cross clamp at the harvest site, next on leaving the remote site, and finally when arriving uh, locally. Uh, those are, those are uh, uh, drawings illustrating the recipient uh, cardiectomy. As you said, uh, those are dotted lines are the sites of, as you can see, aortic bicaval cannulation, uh, sites of uh, the cardiectomy. Here, uh, the well of the perica uh, the pericardial well, after uh, resecting the recipient uh, myocardium, you can see uh, the cuff or good cuff of the uh, left atrium and the uh, good length left of the SVC and IVC with also with the pulmonary and aorta. Uh, and then implantation, donut heart is removed from the transport cooler and placed in the basin of, co uh, of cold saline. Um, the left atrial cup is prepared, connecting the pulmonary, uh, correcting the pulmonary uh, orifices. Uh, many ways to open it depends how much length you have. If, if in case you didn't cut the pulmonary veins, uh, it will be just uh, open. Um, um, the cuff is tailored to the size of the recipient left atrium. Uh, so implantation begins with left atrial anastomosis. Uh, double arm for, for all proline suture is passed through the recipient left atrial cuff at the level of left superior pulmonary vein and then through the donor left atrial cuff. The allograft is lowered into the mediastinum uh, and the suture is continued in a running matter, uh, manner uh, caudally and medially to the inferior aspect of the interatrial uh, septum. So, uh, so uh, this is the left superior pulmonary vein. Uh, you're starting suturing, uh, and then uh, you start uh, running uh, uh, along the borders. So one important point, if I may, it is is a, it is highly crucial at the harvesting team to check for um, any defects, whether it is a, a patent. Uh, foramen ovale, with, whether it is a tricuspid uh, uh, abnormality, mitral abnormality, aortic and pulmonary, you need to check for all of that. Um, uh, and um, you, you have to uh, make sure that uh, the recipient uh, people check again and verify uh, also for the SVC, as I guess vein uh, uh, is uh, sutured, anything that is uh, that could... Uh, that could be with the abnormal level has to be explored. Um, as you exactly mentioned, uh, you verify all cusps and uh, all anastomosis to cater the uh, recipient heart. Thank you.
so the second anal suture is drawn along the roof of the left atrium and down to the intraatrial intra uh, septum. Intraatrial septum. Uh, the any size discrepancy should be assessed and corrected. After completing the left uh, atrium, attention is turned to the IVC. Uh, however, the sequence uh, uh, is different from center to center and from surgeon to surgeon, and depends on the ischemic time. An end-to-end anastomosis is performed for the IVC and a 4 or suture. The most difficult anastomosis and often is more easily performed from the right side of the table. Uh, so this uh, is showing the uh, anastomosis of the left atrium, and then uh, you can see here the uh, cable anastomosis, and then you can see the pulmonary and then a, the aortic anastomosis. So next, end-to-end -end SVC osmosis we showed, uh, constructed using a 5 o You can lock the posterior row with, the, with of anastomosis to minimize the risk of uh, purse uh, uh, string. Uh, so to, uh, to uh, this is one technique to avoid the purse string effect, putting a suture here and a suture there, and then um, 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 uh, just, uh, just to avoid the purse string effect. Uh, and then going through and then tying in the middle. End to end pulmonary uh, artery anastomosis is performed using four-row suture, uh, eliminate any redundancy, and it might cause kinking and lead to RV dysfunction with obstructing the outflow, the uh, RVOT outflow. Um, uh, and then reworm at this time, um, a finely end-to-end -end aortic anastomosis is performed in a similar manner. Before the aortic anastomosis is secured, the lungs are ventilated and the heart is manip manipulated to fast facilitate de airing through the anastomosis. Sorry. Um, in case where uh, prolonged ischemia at times are enc encountered, the... Uh, the uh, uh, so, uh, in case prolonged scheme is encountered, the uh, so the left atrium and the aorta can be done uh, initially, and then the cross clamp can be uh, uh, removed, um, um, and then of course with and, and the cable uh, uh, snares released. Um, um, it, and then the IVC, but sometimes it might make it difficult for the IVC anastomosis because it can be also difficult, but it, it's, it's a way uh, uh, of uh, saving more time and perfusing the myocardium. An aortic vent cardioplegia ne uh, needle is then placed and if desired, a dose of warm cardioplegia can be administered before removal of the cross clamp. A uh, patient is placed in a steep uh, Trendelenburg uh, position the aortic cross clamp is removed and de airing is continued. Uh, atrial and ventricular pacing wires are placed. Uh, the patient is then weaned from cardiopulmonary bypass. The cardiac surgeon should, look, uh, should work uh, closely with the anesthesiologist to ensure that all metabolic derangements uh, are promptly corrected. Hyperglycemia, hyper or hypokalemia, especially metabolic acidosis, hypercalcemia. Volume resuscitation should be closely monitored, especially when blood products are required to correct coagulopathy. Um, uh, here, I'll just talk about the alternative technique, techniques. I'll just talk about the YHL, te YHL technique. And if, of course, you need the, uh, let's say, um, historical uh, heterotopic heart transplant. Um, uh, the biatrial uh, technique, uh, not uh, widely used anymore. However, in some situations, uh, uh, it is um, a, like, uh, let's say, saving technique or, or more appropriate technique and a very small neonates, uh, like uh, neonates, and, and it might be uh, the best approach where the, uh, although by cable can be done, and uh, in some patients where the a donor heart is small and the recipient uh, is, uh, uh, let's say, pericardium or mediastinum is big and, the, and wide spaces between uh, the uh, major uh, vessels and the IBC and SVC, and you don't have enough length, length of the uh, SVC and IBC, biatrial technique can be done 
uh, I've seen it uh, recently with one of the cases here in the hospital uh, where by a child uh, was done for a pediatric uh, was in uh, uh, six or seven years old uh, where by a child uh, technique was uh, used. Um, however, alternatives, a, a, a graft might uh, be used uh, if the, you have short, sh short uh, IVC or SVC. So in the biatrial technique, you start with the left atrium and, uh, and uh, after you continue the left atrium, uh, so the IVC is open to the, uh, to the, uh, to the appendage. You avoid, uh, uh, you avoid opening to the uh, SVC, not, not, not to damage the, uh, uh, not to damage the SA uh, node. Um, and then the uh, suturing of the uh, right atrium is uh, continued in this matter. Sorry, it was stuck. And that's how it uh, would look. And the uh, and then you're left uh, and you're left with the aortic and pulmonary uh, anastomosis. Um, uh, studies have been showed that the uh, probably with the, with uh, Bicable uh, technique had a, a better, um, uh, less early mortality, uh, uh, early to moderate, uh, less early to moderate severe uh, tricuspid regurgitation, and early permanent uh, pacemaker uh, implantation was less with bicable uh, technique. Um, uh, Doctor uh, uh, Firas, do you have any more uh, comments or uh, additions on the techniques on the transplant I, I think you covered it all and uh, we have to also keep in mind that uh, Dacron uh, Gortex tube can always be used uh, if in case of shortage uh, uh, IVC anastomosis uh, uh, pulmonary artery uh, main trunk uh, SVC usually SVC we don't have a problem with it it's a problem with the IVC so just keep an open mind uh, to utilize whatever uh, uh, Gore-Tex uh, tubes uh, needed for this okay. thank you uh, uh, this uh, chart showing the survival uh, by errors actually uh, and uh, you can see that uh, uh, and different errors in uh, 82, 91, and then you can compare to 2010, 2017 uh, with uh, a different uh, survival rate with the advancement of uh, more refining the tec uh, technique and uh, uh, post pre and post uh, care. Um, uh, I'm not going to spend time more on. Uh, Complication and rejection, uh, but I believe uh, Nora will talk about that. Um, and uh, you can see here uh, the incidence of rejection, acute rejection, or graft failure, uh, malignancy. I believe Nora will talk about this uh, more. Uh, so what the future? I, uh, I chose to, just to add this, this is a recent uh, publication. Uh, so it's a paper from the... Uh, uh, HB published uh, about the xenotransplantation and it's always like I found it a interesting topic what's the future of heart transplant with the scarcity of uh, availability of donors uh, of course uh, the advancements of mechanical security support as destination therapy and also on the other side having a uh, live uh, tissue which is the alternative to human heart is the uh, xenotransplant, which is which is basically animal animal hearts implanted in uh, humans. Um, so, uh, as you can as you remember from the initially in the talk, uh, the first transplant to human was was uh, animal to human, uh, and uh, but probably the immunologic uh, uh, obstacles uh, and, and and that is huge. And uh, new advancements have been made with uh, genetically modifying uh, some of the animals and uh, uh, like genetically mod modified uh, pigs implanted into uh, chimpanzees, um, uh, removing the, 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 
the specific viral uh, uh, genes of the uh, pigs, and it was it was a good success for uh, with survival of the chimpanzee. It showed very positive results. It was, I believe, what was published in 2019. Uh, so um, this is a table in the paper showing the different uh, uh, primates, uh, like say house dogs and what were the advantage of the uh, uh, of such and the, let's say of course i believe the the apes and uh, um, are the best are the best for such uh, uh, for, for the for humans however this it, it is scarce and uh, has induced retrovirus and i believe uh, research is still ongoing and with genetic uh, genetically mod modified uh, genes of the animals, this might be the future where you actually just um, uh, imagine choosing the um, specific heart and size and uh, to exactly match your recipient. Uh, this is, um, and, and I believe that WHO uh, had uh, a paper, something like uh, with some budget uh, specifically dedicated for this research. And this is the suggested uh, initial uh, patient selection criteria for pig heart transplant xenograft trial, which I don't know when it will be started, uh, with high uh, immunologic risk to, for heart allograft failure. So uh, broadly reactive high test antibody against HLA antigens, history of early onset rapid progression of cardiac allograft as um, and with patients with obstacles to VAD implantation, whether structural, or physiological or severe biological repair. Uh, those would be uh, patients uh, probably eligible. Uh, thank you, everyone, um, and uh, uh, happy to receive any uh, questions or comments. Thank you, Abdullah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Farmas, and thank you, Dr. Uh, Saad. Um, really appreciate your time uh, supervising my uh, presentations. And uh, Mike, to you, uh, Luai. Uh, uh, thank you, Abdullah. This was uh, a really thorough presentation today, and uh, you have covered uh, uh, all the important uh, points that's needed to be discussed. So uh, if anyone has a question in regards to the first or the second topic, uh, please go ahead. Um, and um, it would be always good to know about the marginal donors and uh, how to select uh, these uh, hearts, uh, Abdullah. So also, if you have any question in that regard. Thank you, Dr. Pras. Um, thank you very much, Abdullah, for this uh, informative lecture. And special thanks to Dr. Pras and Dr. Saad. They hope that they have time to be with us for the last lecture complications of heart transplant by Dr. Nora. So we'll have a quick break for five minutes and then we'll join back.
static move on. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, no, I can so. You can see our slides also. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, no. Laura. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. All right. All right. Assalamu alaikum. This is Noor Al-Gimi, cardiac surgeon at King Faisal Specialist Hospital. And today I'll be presenting complications of cardiac transplantation results, immunology and drugs. This topic was supervised by Dr. Msaad Hussain, advanced heart failure and transplant cardiologist. So in this presentation, I'll be talking about some immunologic phases of heart transplantation, followed by immune suppressive modalities, and then we'll jump right into the complications. Okay, so major histocompatibility complex uh, are basically proteins that vary between individuals. And uh, they basically allow the immune system to distinguish self from non-self. They're also known as HLA, uh, human leukocyte antigens, because they're expressed at high levels on leukocytes, uh, which are expressed on the surface of almost every cell in the human body. Now, if recognized by organ recipient, these proteins can trigger the rejection reaction. So we have different uh, major histocompatibility complex uh, proteins, class one, two, uh, and three. So expression of class one molecules is uh, upregulated on the endothelium and parenchymal cells in association with inflammation, including after ischemia and reperfusion. So the T lymphocytes are the primary immune actors in the pathologic reaction to transplanted organ. They basically participate as cytotoxicity and cytokine-mediated inflammation. And many, if not most, of the immune suppressive drugs that are currently in use are actually targeting the intracellular pathways of T cell activation and proliferation. These cells, antibodies, and macrophages also, they contribute in the destruction of the graft and there are drugs targeting um, these um, uh, cells. So the purpose here in immune suppressive modalities in transplantation is to reduce the immune response to a degree which allow the acceptance of the allograft yet provide sufficiently low toxicity to permit prolonged survival of the patient. We have three situations requiring specific combinations of immune suppressive therapy. So the first is induction therapy, which is basically initial high dose of immune suppression to facilitate the graft acceptance. It minimizes the chance of early rejection. Usually this is done intra-op. And then the second approach is maintenance therapy for chronic acceptance of the allograft. And the third one is augmented immune suppression, which is done to reverse episodes of acute rejection. We'll start with the induction therapy. So generally it includes two approaches, anti-CD25 like teclizumab or pesliximab. And we have the anti-thymocyte globulin or anti-CD3, which are also known as OKT3. Currently they're not in use, but they are mentioned in books. So I have a slide on them. So anti-CD25, pesliximab and teclizumab, they are used in induction therapy the mechanism, they're basically monoclonal anti-CD25 antibody. They target the interleukin-2 receptor and inhibit them. 
uh, this prevents the T lymphocytes uh, proliferation and activation. For the dose, Azlixamab administered um, in 20 milligram IV following completion of cardiopulmonary bypass. And then we repeat the same dose on the fourth day post-op. For Declozumab, we administer one milligram per kg a day IV within 24 hours before transplantation. And then we can repeat the same dose at 14 days or after every 14 days for four additional doses. It doesn't usually require monitoring and there are no serious adverse reactions uh, being reported so far. And now we have the OKT3, the anti-CD3 blockers. Uh, antibodies. So basically, they are monoclonal, monoclonal anti-CD3 antibodies that block the alloantigen recognition by modulating or depleting the CD3 molecules, thus depleting T cells. They are you. They used to be um, uh, part of the induction therapy or for steroid resistant or recurrent reject, rejection with hemodynamic in instability. Some of the side effects include cytokine release syndrome, nephrotoxicity. They also increase susceptibility to infections and post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders. That's why they are avoided now. Antithymocyte globulin. They're used in the induction therapy or for steroid resistant reje or recurrent rejection with my or minus hemodynamic instability. The mechanism here they are polyclonal anti T cell antibody preparation. They inhibit the T cell re receptor antigenic peptide interaction, thus destroying the T lymphocytes. For the dose, it varies depending on the institute and the antithymocyte preparation. It doesn't really require monitoring. The, some of the side effects include thrombocytopenia, arthralgias, edema, fever, chills, rarely can lead to systemic reactions like anaphylaxis or serum sickness. Moving on to the maintenance um, immune suppression. So this one usually uh, includes three agents or three classes. We call them the triple drug strategy. The first is calcineurin inhibitors. So we can go with cyclosporin or tacrolimus. And the second is anti-proliferative drugs like mycophenolate, mofetil, or azathioprine, methotrexate, cyclophosphamide, or serolimus. And the third is the adrenocorticosteroids. Now the ideal regimen and the dosage remains in question. So this is not fixed. So starting with tacrolimus, this is an important drug in the chronic maintenance immune suppression. It basically blocks the calcineurin, inhibiting the interleukin-2 production, thus inhibiting the T cell proliferation. For the dose, initial oral or sublingual dose early post-transplant is one to two milligrams Q12 hourly. Close monitoring is important here because tacrolimus is associated with nephrotoxicity. The target levels within the first month is around 12 to 16 nanogram mls a day. And um, be between 31 to 90 days post-transplantation, the target level is 10 to 15. And beyond 90 days, it is five to 12 nanogram mls a day. Now side effects include nephrotoxicity, glucose intolerance, and hyperkalemia. And then we have the cyclosporin, like neural uh, gingraf or sandimmune. It is used um, also for chronic maintenance immune suppression, and it's usually combined with azathioprine or mycophenolate mofetil or with, with or without steroids. It has the same mechanism as the tacrolimus, except they have different binding sites. The dose is initially 25 to 50 milligram BIDBO, and if the renal function remains normal, we can then start increasing the dose. And the target level within the first three months is 250 to 350 nanogram per mL a day. And within the first year, we're supposed to reach 50 to 150 nanogram mL a day. Now, the nephrotoxicity in cyclosporin is um, more severe than uh, in tacrolimus. That's why if we can go with tacrolimus, we go ahead and avoid the cyclosporins. They are also associated with uh, electrolyte imbalance, hypertension, and hypercholesterolemia. It does interact with a lot of medications uh, like erythromycin, ketoconazole, metoclopramide. So that's a, another disadvantage of going with cyclosporin. 
Okay, so this is the same thing that I mentioned already, different binding sites, but same basic immunosuppressive effect. They inhibit the interleukin to and subsequently T cell proliferation. So if the tacrolimus is considered superior as the cyclosporin is more toxic with uh, so many drug interactions. Moving on to the second category of the maintenance therapy, which is the anti-proliferative drugs. So we have the azathioprine, which is imidazole derivative of 6 mercaptoburin. It is used, it used to be part of the triple therapy, but now it's largely replaced by the MMFs. It is for maintenance immunosuppression. It basically impairs the lymphocyte proliferation by inhibiting the purine synthesis. As for the dose, the maximum oral dose is 2 to 2.5 milligrams per kg a day. Uh, the dose could be reduced as necessary to maintain white blood cells count above 3,000 mls a day. We don't really uh, need to monitor this drug. Um, adverse effects mainly include myelosuppression and malignancy, specifically cutaneous malignancy. If used with allopurinol, it may increase the myelosuppression effect. Now we move on to mycophenolate mofetil. So this is used for chronic maintenance immune suppression. It is hydrolyzed to mycophenolic acid, which is the active immune suppression uh, component, which inhibits the inosine monophosphate dehydrogenase. There be, it inhibits the de novo purine synthesis. So it inhibits the TMP cell proliferation. Now it does have greater anti-proliferative potency than cyclosporin and it has a potentially favorable effect on preventing the allograft vasculopathy, which is another complication that we'll be talking um, about later in this presentation. So for the dose, we can start with 500 milligrams IV or BID oral and progressively increase to a target dose of 1,500 or 1,750 milligrams twice daily if tolerated. Um, so the target level is two to five nanograms per mils a day. And um, the most reported side effects include GI discomfort and bleeding. For cyclophosphamide, it is another choice for maintenance immune suppressive agent. It basically inhibits the lymphocyte proliferation by interfering with the DNA replication and it does inhibit the, um, the B cell responses. For the side effects, it includes myelosuppression, hemorrhagic cystitis, alopecia, GI distress, interstitial pneumonitis, which is rare. We also have methotrexate. It could be used for maintenance immune suppressive therapy. It basically um, antagonizes the folic acid and uh, causes antiproliferative effect on lymphocytes. Major toxicity uh, in bone marrow suppression resulting in leukopenia. That's why we need to uh, do close monitoring of the leukocyte count. Um, now we move on to serolimus. This is another choice for maintenance. It could replace the calcineurin inhibitor, or we can use it as a fourth agent. So the mechanism, it inhibits T cell, P cell activation and proliferation by interfering with the genetic uh, transcription associated with hypercholesterolemia, thrombocytopenia, and poor wound healing. Finally, we reached the last uh, drug in the maintenance um, approach, which is steroids. It's not only used for maintenance immune suppression, but also as pulse therapy for acute rejection. Now, uh, the mechanism, it has an anti-inflammatory anti um, action inhibiting various cytokines, but the most important one here is the interleukin-2. So it impairs the gene transcription process, preventing the T cell activation and proliferation. And we mentioned already that the T cell is the main actor in the immune, um, in the, uh, immune system regarding the trans, uh, transplanted uh, organ. So for the dose and maintenance, we can start with initial prednisone dose of 20 to 40 milligram daily, and we can taper it um, every other day to a dose approximately 0.1 to 0.2 milligram per kg a day or no steroids by six months. In acute rejection, however, we go with 500 to 1000 milligram methylprednisolone IV for three days, or we can go with two to three milligram kg a day of prednisone orally for three days. The side effects are a lot, and they include diabetes, bone disorders, obesity, cushionoid changes, decreased wound healing, can lead to cataracts, the patient can develop peptic ulcer, hypertension, or even psych disorders. 
So thank you, Dr. Nora. Maybe I'll just add uh, one thing is, uh, uh, as Do Dr. Nora presented, there's a lot of options and a lot of uh, uh, things to know about uh, immune suppression and postcardiac transplantation, uh, but there is no real clear randomized clinical trials and uh, there's no clear practice that actually everybody is adopting. So what we read is that's why things you read th things differently and different centers do different things. The bottom line is is uh, you have to assess your patient individually and see what is their immune risk. Are they high risk or low risk? And usually, we see somebody's high risk when they are have a lot of antibodies that I talked about in the HLA. Uh, they are uh, either as bridged with assist devices. Uh, they have. Uh, positive uh, cross-match, uh, uh, women are higher risk than men, and uh, certain ethnicities have higher risk than others. And different centers do differently, but the bottom line is you have to think about what are we gonna do for induction, which is the intense immune suppression you do initially, like uh, giving steroids uh, intraoperatively and uh, ATG or thymoglobulin uh, during the uh, CSICO or immediately after the transplant. And then the maintenance therapy, which is uh, usually uh, steroids plus uh, tacrolimus and, uh, uh, and uh, MMF as first line agent. And the others are usually just like uh, as alternative agents for certain scenarios. All right, thank you, doctor. We will continue with the complications of cardiac transplantation adults. So I'd like to start this part of the presentation, this chart, which I got from an article, which was published, I think, 2018, 2017, comparing the different post-op complications in transplantation and their incidence. So within the first 30 days post-cardiac transplantation, the most common um, or the leading cause of mortality is actually graft failure, fo uh, followed by multiple organ failure and followed by infections. But th this changes uh, dramatically um, after the first month. So within the first year, after the first month, of course, uh, the, the leading cause of mortality in cardiac transplant patients is actually infections. And then from the first year, beyond the first year to the fifth year, we have graft failure being the leading cause of mortality, followed by malignancy. And then beyond five years, the leading cause of mortality in these patients is usually malignancy, which is expected with all the immune suppression that we subject the patients to. We will talk about each and every entity. So first, graft dysfunction. Most cases are mild and they resolve with supportive. However, according to literature, 10 to 15% will progress to primary graft failure, requiring inotropic support, plus minus circuitry mechanical support, and sometimes retransplantation as last resort to save the patient. So primary graft dysfunction, by definition, is severe ventricular dysfunction of the donor graft, which fails to meet the circulatory requirements of the recipient in the immediate post-transplant period. It may manifest as either single or biventricular dysfunction in the context of low cardiac output, hypotension, despite adequate filling pressures. So the incidence ranges between 2.3 to 28%, and the mortality varies by the cause of end-stage heart disease. So again, according to evidence, um, they mentioned that congenital heart disease and valvular cardiomyopathy have the highest 30-day mortality rate due to primary graft dysfunction. The diagnosis is usually made within the, four, the first 24 hours post-transplantation. We can classify it into left ventricular, right ventricular, or biventricular graft failure. And the pathogenesis is not completely understood, but we do, however, have specific risk factors associated with primary graft dysfunction. So donor-dependent factors include donor age, the cause of death, female donor to male recipient, presence of coronary artery disease, LV hypertrophy, the use of catecholamines at the time of death. And then we have the recipient-dependent risk factors, including age, again, presence of increased pulmonary vascular resistance, use of inotropic support or mechanical circulatory support at the time of transplantation, um, having pre-transplantation, 
And then the procedure dependent risks, including donor organ ischemic time, donor to recipient size mismatch, prolonged CPP time, and high transfusion requirements. Now, they do not explain in the, um, the literature why exactly uh, these risk factors, they don't explain the risk factors here, um, but it is something noticeable according to the data. So basically, um, we want to avoid mismatch, whether the gender, the age, um, the weight, in order to avoid this complication. In the presence of risk factors, the radial score is a valid data scoring system that assesses the risk of primary graft dysfunction. So this is the classification of severity of primary graft dysfunction. So we have LV, primary graft dysfunction, and RV. Both of them are subjected to injury from ischemia and reperfusion, and uh, we can get mild to severe form. And the criteria to diagnose this is ejection fraction less than 40 and echo um, uh, characteristics. And then we have high filling pressure, but the cardiac index being low, less than two, the dependency on low inotropic support, or the dependency on circulatory uh, support, which is considered severe form. This is the radial score that I spoke about earlier. Basically, basically, they look at the right atrial pressure, the age of the recipient and the donor, the inotropic dependency, diabetes, length of ischemic time, especially more than 240 minutes. And it's an additive score. So between zero to one, they predict that the patient will get, or they predict that there is 8.3% chance that the patient will develop primary graft dysfunction. If the score is two, then the risk is 11. And if the score is three, then the risk is 24. And if the score is above four to six, the score is 44%. The lowest is zero and the highest is six. This chart I got from another article was, which was published by a cardiac center, a, a cardiac transportation center in Spain. And they were basically trying to test the efficacy and the accuracy of the radial score. So they collected data from patients um, who underwent transplantation between the year of 82 to 2006. And this is their results. So basically 103 patients who had a score, a radial score zero, predicted to have 2.1% um, primary graft dysfunction, but the actual percentage was 2.9, which is very close. And then as we move on with the highest scores, there is uh, a gap, either overestimation or underestimation, but it's still within the same range. So they concluded in their study that the radial scores actually um, have some accuracy to it and it could help um, detect early primary graft dysfunction and treated. Now, if we have a specific cause leading to the graft dysfunction, whether it's intra-op complication, pulmonary hypertension, hyperacute rejection, we can label it as secondary graft dysfunction. Moving on to cardiac arrhythmias. So most transplant recipients require preoperative temporary AV pacing. Uh, so these patients can develop sinus node dysfunction, which is very common. And um, usually they, they recover and there's no need for a permanent pacemaker. So the pathology or the pathways in which the sinus node dysfunction develops include surgical trauma, ischemia and reperfusion injury, and of course, denervation. The incidence is thought to be, to be reduced with bicable anastomosis and increased with prolonged organ ischemia, nodal artery abnormalities, uh, preoperative use of amiodarone, and by atrial anastomosis. So these patients, around five to 30% of them, they will develop AFib, a flatter, or other SV arrhythmias. Individual assessment of the risk-benefit ratio is very important to assess whether these patients require anticoagulation therapy or not. Recurrent arrhythmias um, from re-entry circuits or defined ectopic foci often can be cured by radiofrequency ablation. So that's a possibility. That's one of the choices. SVTs should be treated in the same manner as any other patient who didn't undergo transplant. 
for sustained VT and ventricular fibrillation, they're an important entity because uh, presumably they're responsible for a significant portion of 10% who end up with sudden unexplained deaths post-transplantation. Moving on to renal dysfunction. So pre-op, a lot of patients, a lot of the patients who are um, needing cardiac transplantation will have some degree of impaired renal function course, because of the hypoperfusion. Now, this doesn't get better with the transplantation as the patient gets or uh, as the patient is subjected to high dose of immune suppression uh, drugs for a very long time. So we expect the renal function to even deteriorate. Uh, what we can do is use the induction therapy for these patients at risk and uh, delay the calcineurin therapy. We can also avoid uh, uh, drugs with high nephrotoxic profile like OKT3. Moving on to hyperacute rejection. So this is mediated by pre-existing antibodies to allergenic antigens and they occur immediately after transplantation with rapid graft failure. Now, uh, thankfully it's not as common as in the past because of the current blood and antigen typing techniques. But if it does happen, we need aggressive therapy with immediate plasmapheresis, IVIG, and even mechanical support if needed. Acute rejection, it could be subdivided into cellular or antibody mediated rejection. It accounts for around 8% of deaths after transplantation. And the incidence of any rejection has continued to decrease in the past decade, thanks to immune suppression. Now, in order to diagnose this condition, we need RV endomyocardial biopsy. It is the gold standard, as most patients are asymptomatic. So let's start with the acute cellular rejection. It is characterized by an inflammatory infiltrate on endomyocardial biopsy. The infiltrate is composed of lymphocytes predominantly, plus minus macrophages, eosinophils, and necrosis. Again, we need to do endomyocardial biopsies uh, on routine basis, um, regardless of the symptoms. We do have a grading system according to the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation. So grade zero is considered non-significant, no rejection. Grade one is considered mild acute cellular rejection with interstitial or perivascular infiltrate with up to one focus of myocyte damage, usually doesn't require treatment, just observation. And then we have grade two, which is considered mild acute cellular rejection, two or more foci of a filtrate with associated myocyte damage. Now it depends on the treating team's decision whether to, uh, what, like, whether to start or initiate the treatment and what exactly to do. And then we have grade three, which is considered severe acute cellular rejection, where we have diffuse infiltrate with multifocal myocyte damage, plus minus edema, hemorrhage, and vasculitis. And of course, in this stage, we have to start and initiate treatment. So if the patient is symptomatic, then we have to start high dose steroids, regardless of the, the grading system. If the patient is hemodynamically unstable, then we start anti-thymocyte antibodies, especially if there is no clinical improvement within 12 hours or 24 hours of initiating steroids. For asymptomatic acute cellular rejection, if it's mild, we monitor. If it's severe, we initiate treatment. And if it's moderate, then it's controversial and uh, requires consideration of multiple vari variables. The follow-up biopsy should be performed around one to two weeks after the treatment of symptomatic acute cellular rejection. And uh, we do biopsies two to four weeks after asymptomatic acute cellular rejection is established. The second type here is antibody-mediated rejection, which is basically mediated by the humoral limb of the immune response. And unlike the acute cellular rejection, an antibody-mediated rejection it's common to have hemodynamic instability requiring inotropic support. Asymptomatic AMR is associated with high incidence in the first year and high recurrence rate. 
Um, some studies uh, suggest that there are specific risk factors for AMR, including female gender, pre-transplant elevated panel reactive antibody, cytomegalovirus, seropositivity, Briar mechanical circulatory support or allosensitization against anti-HLA antibodies. They also say it is noticed in uh, patients with prior treatment with OKT3 drugs or those who developed antibodies against the OKT3 drugs. It is also associated with history of retransplantation, multiparity, positive T cell flow cytometry cross match. So the diagnosis requires endothelial cell swelling on light microscopy and immunoglobulin complement deposition seen on immunofluorescence. We have to treat this um, type of rejection aggressively with plasmapheresis, high dose steroids, heparin, IVIG, and cyclophosphamide. And despite all of the aggressive intervention, it is expected that the patient, uh, that our patients will have high mortality rate. So repeated episodes of AMR are highly associated with allograft coronary artery disease. Now we'll move on to the second entity, which, uh, which is infections. So this could be induced by, or it's mainly induced by the immune suppression therapy, most common cause of mortality between one to five years post-transplantation. It could be in the form of upper and lower respiratory tract infections, just among the commonest infections. Um, they usually occur during the first six months post-transplantation, and the incidence of pneumonia in transplant recipients is around 21%, with 75% of the cases occurring within the first three months. Now, 60% of the cases will be due to opportunistic agents, and 25% of the cases would be due to nosocomial. The most frequently identified microorganisms include cytomegalovirus, aspergilla species, pneumocystitis uh, gerofici, and the described overall mortality is around 30.8%. If we have bilateral pulmonary infiltrate with a spurgellus infection, now this is a indicative of a very poor prognosis. Uh, the predominant infection in, the, in uh, patients post-transplantation um, is bacterial septicemia. Now, some infectious agents are linked to other complications post-transplantation. For example, Epstein-Barr virus infection associated with malignancies and the cytomegalovirus associated with allograft vasculopathy and acute rejection. So transmission of infections after organ transplantation, unfortunately is um, well documented and reported. That's why we have to uh, go with preventive measures, including screening, vaccinations, and, uh, and uh, prophylaxis antimicrobial. So among bacteria, gram-negative bacilli are considered the most common, specifically E. coli and Pseudomonas aeruginosa, leading to UTIs and pneumonias, respectively. And among the viruses, the most important one that we need to watch out from is cytomegalovirus. It is associated with acute rejection episodes, um, uh, calf, which we'll talk about later, post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorders, and it can lead to super infection with other pathogens. And then we have fungi. So most commonly mu mucocutaneous candidiasis. Um, however, we have aspergillus, which is um, associated with the highest attributable mortality from fungi. It can cause serious pneumonia in five to 10% of recipients during the first three months after transplantation. Um, if we get dissemination of aspergillus to the central nervous system, now this is a fatal condition. We have this chart. Um, basically, they're comparing different microorganisms, which one is most common. So first month, bacteria is, bacterial infections are more common but then from the second month um, and beyond, viral infections are considered the most common infections post-transplantation. 
All right, moving on to cardiac allograft vasculopathy. Basically, it's a progressive vascular occlusive disease affecting the coronary vessels of cardiac allografts after transplantation. It remains an important morbidity after transplantation. It does resemble atherosclerosis, except that the intimal proliferation is concentric rather than eccentric. And the lesions are diffuse, involving both the distal and the proximal portions of the coronary tree. Now, calcification are, are not common here, and the elastic lamina remains intact. Um, for the incidence, is around 7.8% at one year, but then it rises to nearly 50% at 10 years. Risk factors include male gender, ischemic cardiomyopathy prior to transplant, and re-transplant. We have a grading system for cardiac allograft vasculopathy as well. So grade zero means non-significant, no detectable angiographic lesions. Grade one is considered mild, grade two is moderate, and three is severe. So for the mild one, the definition is angiographic left main that is less than 50% or primary vessel with lesion less than 70% or branch stenosis less than 70% without allograft dysfunction. Now for the moderate cardiac allograft vasculopathy, it is when we have angiographic left main that is more than 50% or primary vessel with lesion that is more equal to 70% or branch stenosis more than 70% in branches of two systems without allograft dysfunction. Uh, if we do have a graft dysfunction with the same criteria as the moderate, then we call it severe. So because of the denervation of the allograft, it is expected that even if the patient develops coronary artery um, uh, sorry, cardiac allograft vasculopathy, it will be asymptomatic. That's why we have to do screening with coronary angiography. Usually we start at the first year post-transplant and then we do it either annually or biannually. If the patient do develop this condition, we treat it with by modifying the immune suppressive agents, uh, by using statins, which according to literature is very important not only provides control of the cholesterol levels, but has anti-inflammatory immune modulatory benefit in these patients. Now we avoid PCI and cabbage. If we do them, we only do them to um, specific uh, patients because they do not even improve the survival in this category. Uh, one thing, Victoria, just to add on, uh, uh, vasculopathy is a very devastating uh, complication uh, because once it develops, the survival is going to be very, very bad. So one of the th things we do is when we, uh, we do screening, like our protocol is one, uh, we do screening at one year, then three years, then five years, then 10 years. And what we do is usually uh, we put them on statin after transplant immediately to prevent it. And we modify immune suppression so that we put them on seromus uh, as uh, as you presented, because sorolomus prevents this uh, process from happening. Yes. So we can put them on sorolomus uh, after the tr uh, transplant, or uh, if we see any signs of vasculopathy uh, on the routine angiography, because uh, PCI and cabbage, they don't do anything. And even like if they have symptoms, they don't improve their uh, symptoms because usually it's a diffuse distal vessel disease. So do we use sorolomus like lifelong when we have signs uh, or uh, like uh, angiographic uh, uh, characteristics suggestive of uh, calf? Yes. Is it like so lifelong? What, okay. Yes. Sorry. So what we do is usually uh, the problem with sorolomus, like somebody might ask, okay, so if it's that good, why not use it early from the beginning of transplant? The problem with sorolomus, it prevents wound healing and it's not very good for rejection. So we know that person, people are at most of rejection. Uh, the most risk of rejection is early on, and usually they have major surgery. So we uh, don't use sorolomus early on, uh, but the moment we see signs of vasculopathy, we switch them to sorolomus. Uh, one of the immune suppressions, we switch it to sorolomus, and then uh, see how things go. Okay, great. 
So moving on to malignancy, it is the fourth most common cause of death at five years after transplantation. Um, up to 28% of patients will have malignancy by year 10 after transplantation. The most common malignancies are usually skin. They can get lymphomas and they're actually more devastating with higher mortality rate than skin uh, malignancy. So the neoplastic disorders, how do they develop post-transplantation? Could be different pathways. They could be having pre-existing malignancies or transmission of malignancy from the donor to the recipient, or it could be de novo malignancy arising after transplantation. So the first entity, pre-existing malignancies, it is of course contraindicated to start um, to subject the patient to transplantation if they have active cancer. So what they mean here, if the patient had history of malignancy and then um, long term uh, or long interval of uh, being cured or labeled um, cancer free, uh, then they could undergo transplantation. And there is risk, of course, with all the immune suppression agents that the patient will get recurrence. And then we have the transmission of malignancy from donor to recipient through the shed cells. And then we have the de novo malignancy arising after transplantation, also mediated by the immune suppression agents. So tumors most likely to recur in heart transplant recipients are carcinomas of lung, lymphoma, skin cancer, carcinoma of the bladder as well. Moving on to hypertension. So systemic hypertension should be treated to prevent unnecessary afterload stress on the allograft. In the early post-op period, we can go with IV sodium nitroperside or nitroglycerin. Um, nicard nicardipine infusion has been reported to control post-op hypertension more rapidly and was superior to sodium, sodium nitroperside in maintaining LV performance immediately after drug infusion. Sudden cardiac death. This is reported in 12.7% of patients who underwent cardiac transplantation. The major causes uh, presumed arrhythmia, cardiac arrest, myocardial infarction, could be pulmonary embolism, or rejection. Now, according to um, evidence, it is suggested that it's associated with male patients, especially those who had previous history of hypertension or coronary artery disease prior transplantation. So this is a summary of the presentation or the important points that were mentioned. So during the first year, graft failure is the leading cause of mortality. And then we have infection and multi-organ failure. In the long term, malignancies are the most or the leading cause of malignancy followed by graft failure and uh, cardiac allograft, vasculopathy and infections as well. Um, chronic kidney diseases are common after transplantation and they are associated with increased mortality. Uh, diabetes mellitus as well is uh, very common. 39% of heart transplant recipients develop diabetes. Um, and this is associated with the steroids use, of course. Management of primary graft dysfunction is mostly supportive, but early mechanical circulatory support could improve the survival. Thank you so much. I can receive questions or comments now. Uh, thank you, Doctor. That was very well done. Uh, one thing, just uh, as a point, uh, uh, as you see, transplant is not a benign. Uh, heart transplant is not a benign thing. It's not like cabbage or valve replacement. Uh, once it's not a cure for a um, uh, problem, like once you get transplant, you're starting the clock because most patients, they don't survive more than 10 to 15 years mm -hmm. at most. So uh, the bottom line is, I, I know this does, maybe doesn't apply to for surgeons, but don't do a transplant un unless the patient really needs it, okay? And as a surgeon, uh, whenever you do transplant, just be sure the patient exhausted all the uh, available uh, medications for heart failure before they uh, you do the uh, surgery. Because I see like it's a very, very uh, uh, complicated and most of the time patients will end up with a lot of side effects uh, over the years. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions from the audience?
Thank you, Nora. Well done. يعطيكم العافية شكرا Thank you very much, Nora, and thank you, Dr. Ramsaad, for your time and effort. And by this, we'll conclude our session for today. Thank you very much, and see you next week. Thank you.